the gods of Eden. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. Nice. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters of the servants to Brothers of the Serpent podcast, coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science, nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau. This week, we are, as you heard, going to be starting uh, a deep dive book report into the book Gods of Eden by William Bramley. Uh, and for this episode, this uh, inaugural episode of this book report, we actually have uh, the lovely Laura, who does all the intros for us, in the studio with us. She's going to be sitting in on this episode. Hey, babe. Hi. It's me. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> so she will be, uh, she'll be giving her a commentary from the nickel seats. Yes. All and right. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. It's Glad to awesome. have you. Yeah. So the Watcher will be here with us at some point. He's still working right now. And uh, that reminds me, I've been wanting to say this Uh you know, all joking aside about how he's in space, most of you have probably picked up on the fact that the Watcher is an EMT. You know, he goes around with the ambulance. So I just wanted to say that this dude is on the front lines of what's happening right now with this whole virus thing. And uh, he's picking up extra shifts because other people are not coming into work. So I just wanted to give a shout out to the guy. He's a freaking hero. You know, that's how I feel about it. He's... Kicking some ass. Yeah, buddy. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah. It always, it, uh, I, I've, I've known Brett for years and this is what he's always wanted to do is like save people. And so it really has like made me proud of him that he's doing that, especially in these times right now. He's just kicking so much ass. So thanks, buddy. We, uh, yeah. And thanks for saving us yeah. on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just saving everybody most all of the time. The time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was that one time, but, you know, most of the time <laughs> he's saving us from being totally wrong. All right. <laughs> all right. Let's go ahead and do Space Weather News from spaceweather.com, where we get all our Space Weather News. The solar wind has arrived and... Unex <laughs> an unexpected stream of solar wind is blowing around Earth. On April 8th, the stream's velocity is only moderately high, 450 kilometers per second, but it contains south-pointing magnetic fields that can open cracks in Earth's magnetosphere. Arctic sky watchers should be alert for auroras mixed with springtime twilight. Also, aurora surprise. Auroras were not in the forecast for April 7th. Nevertheless, they appeared in force over Utsjoki in Finland. Despite the full moon, we witnessed a beautiful explosion of green with the purple nitrogen fringe as well, reports Ryan Elzine, who took this picture, which you guys can see if you go to spaceweathernews.com or spaceweather.com. It says, he says, we've reached the time of year when the northern horizon never gets totally dark. Nevertheless, aurora season is not over yet. So what caused the display? Unexpectedly, a crack opened in Earth's magnetic field. Solar wind poured in to spark these lights. Soon the night sky will be too bright for Arctic observers to see the auroras. Just in case, I said goodbye until September, but who knows, maybe we will get more luck in the coming days, says Elzine. Indeed, more luck could be in the offing. A high st speed stream of solar wind is approaching Earth, flowing from a hole in the sun's atmosphere. Estimated time of arrival is April 10th to 11th, so stay tuned. And yeah, the current conditions, uh, they are high, a bit high. The solar wind speed is 446.5 kilometers per second, and the density is a very high 12.2 protons per cubic centimeter. Ow. <laughs> yeah, look, I got, a, I got a proton burn today. <laughs> look at that. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. <laughs> Farmer's proton burn. <laughs> That's right. uh, and yeah, so uh, Brad from Cosmographia, you know, Brad is Randall's associate, uh, he listened to the last episode with Dr. Chandra, and he was talking to me later on about the, you know, about what his surprise at the numbers that were given out for, you know, the, the solar wind. He was like, you know, 400 kilometers a second. Think about that. Yeah, that's... A second. That's really fast. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I've never thought of it that way. But yeah, yeah it's all, you know, sometimes we get 600 kilometers a second. That's yeah. moving. And these are, you know, protons are... Um, the like massy particles, massy particles so that, you know, they got some punch there. So Yeah, I had never really thought of it until he pointed it out, too. I was yeah. like, oh, yeah, 
Wow. Yeah, they're moving pretty quick. Pretty fast. Yep. All right, what you got? Also, um, <laughs> on, <laughs> on that same show, he, he was talking about how George was calling the um, – Wakramasinga show the most important podcast. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, thanks, buddy. But but I realized, like, no, he's talking about that show. <laughs> no, but he's talking about Dr. Chandra's work. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But still, right. thanks. Yeah. First, I figured out, like, <laughs> he's like the most important podcast ever. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was like, no, wait. No, wait. He's he just that, that show. episode. And he's really talking about that guy. And we were like, wow, thanks, buddy. Wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. He's talking about that guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we didn't really do anything. <laughs> but still, thanks, George. <laughs> Yeah, so I got some stuff here. This is from, this is actually a, this is from sciencedaily.com, uh, science news, and it looks like, I mean, it's kind of like a story, but it almost looks like a paper, mm. the way it's written. Anyway, this is one of my boring stories. It's actually not very boring <laughs> at all. <laughs> How earthquakes deform gravity. Lightning, one, two, three, and thunder. For centuries, people have estimated the distance of a thunderstorm from the time between lightning and thunder. The greater the time gap between the two signals, the further away the observer is from the location of the lightning. This is because lightning propagates at the speed of light with almost no time delay, while thunder propagates at the much slower speed of sound, around 340 meters per second. Earthquakes also send out signals that propagate at the speed of light and can be recorded long before the relatively slow seismic waves, uh, which are about 800 kilometers per second. However, the signals that travel at the speed of light are not lightning bolts, but sudden changes in gravity caused by a shift in the Earth's internal mass. Only recently, these so-called PEGS, uh, P-E-G-S, these PEGS signals, which... I guess that means, okay, here it it's is. an acronym? Pro yeah, Prompt Elastogravity Signals <laughs> were detected by seismic measurements. With the help of these signals, it might be possible to detect an earthquake very early before the arrival of the destructive earthquake or tsunami waves. However, the gravitational effect of this phenomenon is very small. It amounts to less than one billionth of Earth's gravity. Therefore, PEGS signals could only be recorded for the strongest earthquakes. In addition, the process of their generation is complex, they are not only generated directly at the source of the earthquake, but also continuously as the earthquake waves propagate through Earth's interior. And, and I'm assuming that as that wave, as the seismic wave moves, yeah, ev like the wave front area of density, the yeah. wave front of that seismic wave is constantly putting out yeah. these light speed gravitational waves, which is just, this is crazy to yeah. me. Yeah, oh, like, gravity moves at light speed? Well, the gravitational waves, yeah. right, which is the compression and rarefaction of space and time. Yeah. <laughs> which so that only moves at light speed. Is, yeah. That's, <laughs> this is just really, I think, mean, I don't know. This is really strange. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, okay, so they're not only generated directly at the source of the earthquake, but also continuously as the earthquake waves propagate through the Earth's interior. Until now, there has been no direct and exact method of... Uh, to reliably simulate the generation of PEGS signals in the computer. The algorithm now proposed by the GFZ researchers around uh, Rongjiang Wang <laughs> can calculate PEGS signals with high accuracy and without much effort for the first time. The researchers were also able to show that the signals allow conclusions to be drawn about the strength, duration, and mechanism of very large earthquakes. The study was published in the journal Earth and Planetary Science Letters. That's just, I don't know, something about that is yeah. I'm like, yeah, there's, there's something strange going on here. Right. Like, if, a, if an earthquake can produce a gravitational wave, however, uh, I guess the way I'm looking at it is, is imagining this, this medium, whatever it is the, the light travels in, that completely permeates everything. Yeah. And you have this extremely low frequency wave. And it somehow agitates this field that usually what we normally think of as very high frequency stuff uh, okay. agitates this field. Right? I see the problem, yeah. So when you get into the light spectrum where things start moving at the speed of light, waves propagate at the speed of light, it's way up there in the frequency range. Yeah. 
far above human hearing. Well, this is way below into the side, you know, and I know that they're, they're saying it's due to the shifts in the earth's mass, but, but if it follows the P wave, then it's, I mean, yeah, there, that's not a shift in the mass, but there's this compressed yeah, it's area really strange. that goes this... out in a, in a, the sphere around the earth, you know, in a circle or whatever, if, if you have a whole front line, if the fault moves, so you've got these seismic waves that go out and those waves contain highly compressed, you know, for seconds, they're highly compressed areas that must yeah. be putting out these pegs. But I see the problem of going from one medium to the other, and it has to, and we don't even know what gravity is traveling in, really, you know, so. Um, yeah, but the fact that it travels at the speed of light, the gravitational waves, suggests that it's the same medium. It has the same properties. The, the gravitational waves, but not That's gravity itself, right? That's what yeah. you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, because they're, they're talking about the same a, type a, of. A, an enormous change in gravity in one area very quickly from, like, high to low makes a gravitational wave in the medium that light travels in. Okay. okay. You see what I mean? That's yeah. that's ringing that medium, but it's not the gravity itself. Okay. <laughs> it's space Yeah, time. I know it's not the gravity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's why I'm saying gravitational waves. Right, yeah. But I think that's confusing to not not you, but you know, the the whole like gravitational waves versus gravity itself. Right, right, right. Uh I would like thing? to know I would like to know what like, if you're looking at this on a seismograph, which, of course, Can we it, can't do, but let's say the seismograph is reading a certain frequency. What is the frequency of the gravitational wave? Is it a ridiculously high frequency? Oh, yeah. I don't or know. is it also a really low oscillation, like a low frequency oscillation? Or is that it would just a single? Interesting. Yeah, I don't I know. I mean, it would have a frequency, but it would just be one wave, right? Sort of like a, a wave. Yeah, if it was just a if it was just a single sine wave, yeah, yeah, that'd be weird. And and the other thing I was just thinking is like, could it? Is it? You know, is it? Is this happening because uh, the 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 these pressures that are going through all this material in Earth's field is actually doing something with the Higgs field, right? Yeah. Now that we're talking about this, I want to read the rest of the story. I was going to leave it. <laughs> were you going to say something? I was going to. <clears throat> I was going to ask. Did you? Am I understanding that you're saying that uh, gravity moves at the speed of light? Is that what you're saying? That's the that. Well, the gravitational, gravitational waves, waves, which is no. not the same as gravity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But there, it's confusing, right? <laughs> that is confusing. <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't just push rewind on the yeah <laughs> <laughs> not yeah not not while so you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah I no, clarify, but... do i want to continue going this whole time like no no yeah. no yeah. when you're live but not live you have to actually <laughs> ask the questions That's if you right. don't understand something yeah. <laughs> okay okay Woo, got that one out of the way Back on okay track. so well, maybe this will answer some questions here okay <laughs> and i admit that i didn't really study this story it, it, i've got this story a long time ago you as said this was a boring story I know it was kind of a joke. <laughs> like, wait a minute, this is not boring at all. This is I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's that's what I'm saying. It's not actually boring. Okay. However, every earthquake also generates waves in the Earth itself, which in turn change the density of the rocks and thus the gravitation a little bit for a short time. The Earth's gravity oscillates to some extent in sync with the earthquake. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, the, 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 because the, that wave moving through all the material, whether it's rocks or whatever, magma, it's a compression and rarefaction. That's what you're saying, yeah. Basically, it changes the density changes of the, the rocks density, and thus very the gravitation. Briefly. So the gravitation of that particular part Location. of the matter changes to have a higher amount of gravity. And that's why I'm thinking it's a Higgs field thing. Mm. Kyle's shaking his head at me. No, I'm, I'm shaking my head. I feel like I just made a breakthrough with where you were going. All right, good. No, I understand. I'm, I'm shaking my head at, at, at this, oh. this. Okay, all right. <laughs> this proposition here. But uh, uh, let's see. Furthermore, this oscillating gravity produces a short-term force effect on the rock, which in turn triggers secondary seismic waves. So, some of these gravitationally triggered secondary seismic waves can be observed even before the arrival of the primary seismic waves. We, f we faced the problem of integrating these multiple interactions to, to make more accurate estimates and predictions about the strength of the signals, says Torsten Damm, head of the section Physics of Earthquakes and Volcanoes at GFZ. 
Rongjang Wang and the <laughs> <laughs> ingenious idea of adapting an algorithm we had developed earlier to the pegs problem and succeeded. Okay, so this guy had a, had an ingenious idea. Sorry, yeah, I read that. But his name too. is Rong. His name is Rongjiang, <laughs> R-O-N-G-J-I-A-N-G. -G, oh, okay, all right. Wang. <laughs> uh, he says we first applied our new algorithm to the Tohoku quake off Japan in 2011, which was also the cause of the Fukushima tsunami. Yeah, that was like an eight, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so they're just all right. So they're they're talking about their algorithm for for being able to. Um, what are they using to detect these gravitational waves? I mean, is this a LIGO thing? Uh, it doesn't say. Okay, because those are hard to detect. What I thought. It may be. I mean, it could be one of those instruments, and then they're just trying to figure out how to locate it. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> I don't know how to. Because I mean, you if you had LIGO and they're building it for years and years, you must have had. They must have had to have been turning uh, like discounting those as earth noise, right? <clears throat> they must have been picking them up. Yeah, I'm sure they were. And they were also giving themselves a whole bunch of false signals. False right? signals, yeah. It's really strange. <clears throat> anyway, that is that is just weird yeah. to me. Okay, I've got one other one. Uh, this is from LiveScience.com. And... It is remains of 90 million year old rainforest discovered under, under Antarctic ice. <laughs> About 90 million years ago, West Antarctica was home to a thriving temperate rainforest. According to fossil roots, pollen, and spores recently discovered there, a new study finds. The world was a different place back then. During the middle of the Cretaceous period, which is 145 million to 65 million years ago, dinosaurs roamed Earth and sea levels were 558 feet or 170 meters higher than they are today. Sea surface temperatures in the tropics were as hot as 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 degrees Celsius. The scorching climate allowed a rainforest similar, the, similar to those seen in New Zealand today to take root in Antarctica, the researchers said. The rainforest's remains were discovered under the ice in a sediment core that a team of international researchers collected from a seabed near Pine Island Glacier in West Antarctica in 2017. As soon as the team saw the core, they knew they had something unusual. The layer had formed about 90 million years ago. The layer that had formed about 90 million years ago was a different color. It clearly differed from the layers above it. Study lead researcher Johan Klages, or Klages, a geologist at the Alfred Wegener Institute Helmholtz Center for Polar and Marine Research in Bremerhaven, Germany, said in a statement. Back to the lab, the team put the core into a CT computer or computer top tomography scanner. The resulting digital image showed a dense network of roots throughout the entire soil layer. Wow. The dirt also revealed ancient pollen uh, spores and the remnants of flowering plants from the Cretaceous period. By analyzing the pollen and spores, study co-researcher Ulrich Salzman, a paleoecologist at Northumbria University in England, was able to reconstruct West Antarctica's 90 million year old vegetation and climate. <clears throat> the numerous plant remains indicate that the coast of West Antarctica was, back then, a dense, temperate, swampy forest, similar to the forests found in New Zealand today, Salzman said in a statement. The sediment core revealed that during the mid-Cretaceous, West Antarctica had a mild climate with an annual mean air temperature of about 54 degrees Fahrenheit or 12 degrees Celsius, similar to that of Seattle. Summer temperatures were warmer with an average of 66 degrees Fahrenheit, 19 degrees Celsius. In rivers and swamps, the water would have reached up to 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees Celsius. In addition, the rainfall back then was comparable to the rainfall of Wales, England today, the researchers found. As these temperatures are impressively warm, given that Antarctica had a four-month polar night, meaning that a third of every year had no life-giving sunlight. That's <clears throat> that was going to be my question. Yeah, we have a rain remember we've had this. Yeah. We've had this. <laughs> I have a rainforest when there's four months of darkness. <laughs> However, Do they have a picture of the really old flower. They don't. I'm like sure a it's, makeup of the. Like I'm sure a, it's like fragments. And, it's yeah, it's fossil core. So it's I in a sediment core. I know it would be odd, but the, um, but they said they're that they're known Cretaceous flower plants, so there are probably other other fossils of them. Oh. Yeah, yeah. 
So however, the world was warmer back then, in part because the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere was high, even higher than previously thought, according to the analysts of the sediment core, yeah, the like researchers uh, analysis of the sediment core, the researchers said. 1,200 ppm, something like that. Before our study, the general assumption was that global carbon dioxide concentrations in the Cretaceous were roughly 1,000 ppm. Um, but in our model-based experiments, it took concentration levels of 1,120 to 1,680 parts per million mm. to reach the average temperatures back then in Antarctica. Wow. These, <laughs> these findings show how potent greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide can cause temperatures to skyrocket. <laughs> so much so that today's freezing West Antarctica once hosted a rainforest. Moreover... It shows how important the cooling effects of today's ice sheets are, the researchers said. <laughs> <laughs> Got tired of that pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. So pardon the agenda at the end of the article, but that right. is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a recent find, too. Very interesting. But don't wow. kill the messenger. It's just the phone. It's just the... No, well, no, it, that's just a tradition on yeah, this show. Yeah. You just throw the phone down. Throw man. the phone down when you're done. <laughs> oh, okay. Man, poor. But phone. yeah, I don't like, normally I'm just do it. Yeah. Supplying. It's usually me. I don't normally do it. I, I threw it down because uh, yeah, you're right. I took it out on the phone. <laughs> that's why it has. A, that's why that. it has a life proof case. I was thinking about that saying the other day. Don't kill the messenger. Yeah. yeah. Do you guys know what the deal is? I mean, like, yeah, don't shoot the messenger. Yeah, because, like, I mean. Well, you know how sometimes, though, you'll be like, so I was thinking about this saying, and then I looked into it, and then I found this whole history, and. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that Is probably. Is there any special history about don't kill the messenger? Well, I mean, it's just, it's been a, there's been a problem with that all throughout history. You know, some king is like, take this message to my mm -hmm. hated rival king, and that guy goes and says, this guy said you're a total asshole, and then yeah. he gets tortured and killed. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Don't. I was thinking the same I thing. Mean, yeah, you put it in a I'm monarchy situation, yeah, 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 it gets yeah. real bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's probably just that. It's probably just that. Also, also... I may Google it, just see if maybe I can... Yeah. Also, there was a thing, like, you know, so if there... And you've probably seen this in movies. It's a classic. <clears throat> Any movie that has a siege of a city or a castle in it, before the siege starts, they always send some guy mm -hmm. up to the gates to talk, and if that guy gets <laughs> shot by the arrows, then the siege starts, right? Just, but don't, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> Right. I like it. I like the saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's good. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so I got some emails. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> ooh, ooh. I'm excited. <clears throat> I like this time. Okay, so this one's titled, If you read this on the show, call me Johnny Cottonmouth. <laughs> so, Lucky. Johnny says, hey, guy, lo love the show, guys. I've been listening for a while now. I did a job at sea, and when you cross the equator, they have a ceremony where you do some weird things, and then you are initiated into Neptune's domain, so to speak. Yeah. Details of what the ceremony will will be in details of the ceremony will be in YouTube, and it is not really taken seriously by some crews. But nevertheless, this old ritual still exists, and I have a certificate of ignor ignorance to prove it. <laughs> some Johnny Cottonmouth. I was thinking something like they call him a. The turtle, something with a turtle. Who? When once you cross the equator, there's a like a I'm trying to remember what it was. I think Dave told me there's oh, yeah. a phrase that they you're one of them, like you're a turtle something. Oh whatever, wow, cool. Think, or I don't remember what it is. Somebody correct me on that. <laughs> Too bad the watcher's not here. So. I'll text Dave. You keep going. <laughs> okay. All right. This is from Roddy, <clears throat> called Malta Cartruts. He says, "Dear Ophidian siblings." Just had a thought. Has anyone charted the cart ruts in Malta to see if they align with celestial movements or events? Thank you in advance. The ever curious Roddy Mammal. That's a great question. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, yes. Um, the problem with the cart ruts on Malta is, first of all, there's thousands of them. And second of all, they're curvy. So, uh, you know, they, they look more like um, tracks in mud. You know, like if you if, if you've ever been to a place where people have been driving through the mud or whatever, there's just random tracks going all over the place. That's what they look like in a lot of places. Now, some in some cases, they'll have long straight stretches, but there's always curves and stuff at the end. So they don't really. There is a one on the Samipata megalith though that's just straight. That's true. You that's check that one. Completely true. Yeah, you're totally right about that. But yeah, as far as I know, they don't. It's you know, it's celestial alignments would. You could basically make anything since they curve all over the place. 
Yeah. But there's rarely a straight stretch on any of the cart ruts, as far as I know. Okay. This is from Edward Nightingale, called the Giza Template. <clears throat> it says, hello, gentlemen. Great job you guys are doing with Randall and Brad and Silent Mike. I have had the pleasure of traveling around 10,000 miles with my brothers, and I am more than grateful to have had the experience and to have had met Randall and Brad. We met in Minnesota at a conference where I was presenting my research. I am a master carver and furniture maker by trade and researcher and author by choice. Nothing more exciting than exploring ancient mysteries and seeking the truth. Anyway, I've been listening to all of the shows with Randall and have been listening to a few of your shows as well. I really like the work you are doing. My research, and it goes well beyond my book, The Giza Template, would fit very nicely in the topics you have been covering. I'd love to join you guys one night and give you an overview of my work. Keep up the good work, and I hope we can have a chat one day. Also, you can count me in on the Scablands trip. I was there back in 2017 with Randall and Brad and would love to do it again. Again, two thumbs up with your work. Thanks, Ed. And he gives his website as www.thegizatemplate.com. So everybody should check that out. Awesome. Wow. And we probably you. will get him on the show. I talked to Brad, and Brad was like, oh, yeah, Ed's awesome. So uh, thanks, cool, Ed. Cool, man. Thanks, really buddy. appreciate it. Yeah. Wow. And we'll, 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 uh, we'll get in touch. Uh. Okay, this is a comment from the website on episode 141 with Dr. C. Uh, this is Finitorium. It just says, great show. I also got extremely sick late January. Lasted two to three weeks. Dry cough and fever. Very strange coincidences. Stay safe and stay healthy. Snacks! Yep. <laughs> yep. Lots of people saying that. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, this is a comment on episode 140 with the Serpent family. And this person just is, is saying... Uh, I should have waited until morning to listen so I wouldn't still be laughing at 2 a.m. And awake at 4.30 a.m. still occasionally giggling. <laughs> That's good. Uh, let's see. All right. This is from Rob. Also a comment on episode 141 with Dr. C says, thanks, guys. I've always wondered about the panspermia idea. Bacteria on the outside of the ISS is bizarre. Of course, what popped into my mind are the videos purporting to show living organisms outside the ship caught on film by the astronauts, including space snakes. <laughs> space snakes. <laughs> True. Yeah, those the what, they look like little horseshoe crabs or yeah. something. I don't remember what, yeah. what we were calling them, but those are weird. I thought about bringing that up, too, to Dr. C, but... Yeah. Well, he didn't bring it up, so. <laughs> <laughs> Could there be giant space I think, bacteria? I think the space snake was the, the tether. tether. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> That's a great name for it. Yeah. And there's one other here, but I'll, I'll have to get this into the next episode. But this is from Kevin. So, Kevin, I did get this email, but you want me to look at something on Google Maps. So, I didn't do that. So, I'll have to check that out and do it on the next episode. All right. We got one up boxes. <gasps> no. Yes! <laughs> I'm so excited about this uh, too. <clears throat> yeah, it's, I managed to get them, even though that the um, the post office right now is open for only two hours a day. I got an extremely small <laughs> knife so, so that Russ can only stab himself about an inch. You just need to not watch. <laughs> well, I have yet to cut myself doing this. <laughs> I know that who this is from because it's a cube. Well, you wait a minute. I thought you did cut yourself like the first time. Maybe I did cut myself. <laughs> yeah. You were bleeding like the. I thought we decided not to talk about that. Oh wait, is there anything in there? Ah. Hopefully, it's not just contaminated air, but it's just air. <laughs> there it is. That's what he went meant oh. to say. Let me read the. There's a card in here. Snakes. I remembered Kyle saying that all you need. Now was a red pyramid to go with the black one and the white ones I sent. So here you go. Now the set is complete. Oh. <laughs> awesome, dude. So now take all three outside, place under Orion, and tap all three with your 432 hertz tuning fork and walk through a false door and bam, straight to pyramids. Yes. <laughs> Much love, your friend, History Shift. And snakes, of course. Smiley face. Dude, that's awesome. That Look is. That. Wow. Man, bro. Full really set. Us up. Yes, Full set. <laughs> they're over here by me. I get to play with them and check them out. And That's awesome, experiment. dude. Thank you so much. And I think this one, I know this is a book uh, straight from Amazon to Snake Bros. 
I think oh. this is from. <laughs> you almost just, just cut your just leg. Just don't open. watch. <laughs> ah. Oh. The Mars Ooh. Mystery by Graham Hancock. Full is size. From, is that from Soraya? I think this is from. Well, let's see. There's a note. No, there's not. Uh, I think this is from Jeff. Okay. Well, you said, I think you said it on when we were on. Right. I was like, I don't, that's the one I don't have. Yeah. I have since purchased it on Kindle, but this is great. Always good to have the actual book. So yeah, you want to read the back or I'll read it or whatever. Yeah. The Mars Mystery. In his most riveting and revealing book yet, Graham Hancock examines the evidence that the barren red planet was once home to a lush environment of flowing rivers, lakes, and oceans. Could Mars have sustained life and even civilization? Megaliths found on the parched shores of Cydonia, a former Martian ocean, mirror the geometrical conventions of the pyramids at Egypt's Giza necropolis. Especially startling is a sphinx-like structure depicting a face with a distinguishable diadem, teeth, mouth, and an Egyptian-style headdress. Might there be a connection between the structures of Egypt and those on Mars? Why does NASA continue to dismiss these remarkable anomalies as a trick of the light? Hancock points to the intriguing possibility that ancient Martian civilization is communicating with us through the remarkable structures it left behind. In exploring the possible traces left by the Martian civilization and the cosmic cataclysm that may have ended it, the Mars mystery is both an illumination of our ancient past and a warning that we still have time to heed about our ultimate fate. Sounds good. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, buddy. Okay. All right. Let's take a break. Thanks, everybody. Oh, yeah. Okay. Wow. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And you are listening to Slow Roll. Yeah. This is a new mix of a jam that me and Daniel, Daniel's playing the bass. I'm doing all the other stuff. We might get some drums laid down on it soon, too, but it's, it's uh, I don't know, just yeah. came back to it. I, play, I played it a few times a while back when we first did it, but yeah. Daniel, who gave us, like, one of the best commentary on the last episode. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I wanted to say one more thing about this gravitational waves, earthquakes, gravitational waves, real quick. LIGO, or um, what's the other one? Uh, I don't remember. Why did I just... I drew a blank. The, (laughs) the, The experiment that detected gravitational waves, they had to correct for traffic. I mean, yeah, you know, city traffic, city traffic, yeah. all. Okay. So they needed this really quiet yeah, and very still, uh, situation free of a bunch of vibrations. Yeah. So I find it difficult to believe that one of those instruments would be detecting this how can they correct because the earthquake itself is going to be registering yeah. by moving the mirrors but that's later <clears throat> the gravitational wave moves at speed of light that's a good point way faster okay thank you for that uh, but still they didn't mention that in yeah, the article right. so i need to go look into it but the thing that that intrigues me about this <laughs> is that incredible like the thought is very low frequency wave waveforms can propagate at the speed of light. Yeah. Right? Physical mechanical vibrations can make waves that propagate at the speed of light yeah. and they can be very low frequency. That's the key to me. Okay, yeah. Right. And I find that very interesting, but <clears throat> anyway, something being low frequency while going at the speed of light means it has means it has a really long incredibly wavelength. long wavelength. Yeah. yeah. But they're calling it gravitational waves. There's a lot of questions based on that thing. But anyway, I just yeah. wanted to say that that's that's Good one points. of the things I'm trying to wrap my brain around. But yeah, 
And how would they, you know, once... Anyway, <laughs> I need to look into it further. <clears throat> okay. So, The Gods of Eden. Uh, this book, I first read this the first time we went to the big family reunion. I, on the way down there, I was reading this book for the first time. Cape Sam Blast? Yeah. Mm. So when was that? What year was that? 2014? It was November something. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I Very didn't precise. have a baby. So it was before, it was before 2016. I wasn't pregnant. So it was pre- yeah. That's what I yeah, thought. 2014. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Yeah. After you're a mom, you base everything on, uh, that's how you tell right. time. You this, tell time just differently. Before and after. When, once you become a mom, you tell time differently. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> so this is like the fourth time I'm going through the book. And this is the first time I'm doing it with an actual copy of the book. So this book is not, there's no, um, Kindle version or like official digital version that I could buy. Um, okay. I obviously previously had always read it with a PDF, read it with on a PDF and all the PDFs are, well, this is kind of inside baseball, but the PDFs are sort of cumbersome because each page of the PDF has two pages of the book on it. Like they flattened the book out and scanned it. Right. Mm. And then, but you know, but so, that the text has been OCR'd so that people can, like Kyle and, and Jeff, have been able to get their readers to read it mm. to them. Which means that, but but when I look at the PDFs, when I open it in my PDF reader, what I see is like two pages of a scanned book. Yeah. Okay, so it makes it very difficult to zoom. You guys, you got to zoom in and out and swipe back and forth, and it's kind of oh. a pain. Yeah, no. So I ordered the actual book from Amazon. The, you know, so this is the first time. I'm going to be doing a full book report using an actual book. Get ready, Anne. <laughs> Here it comes. Real yes. bookmarks. <laughs> Real bookmarks. So you guys are going to be hearing the pages turn and everything. It's going to be a, it's going to be oh. a, a you know, very very tactile experience. Okay. Audio it will be unfolding before your very <laughs> eyes and ears. <laughs> Here we go. I'm ready. So, the search begins. So, okay, again, I'm going to say the beginning of this book as I was going through it, the beginning is there's so much stuff in here. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of marks at the beginning. And as we, as we go through the book and you guys begin to get the idea, I'll probably do less and less. I'll just be, uh, uh marking incidents in history that I find interesting. Cause there's a whole bunch of stuff in this book. This book is very thick. Uh, but I remember from reading it multiple times that there's a whole bunch of stuff I probably won't go through, Yeah. but in the beginning, I'm going to be reading almost everything, at least up to, you know, chapter five or something. Um, so for those of you who are coming to this podcast later and looking at the entire series and thinking, oh, great, this is a full reading of the book. It's not it's still abridged, but this is like the Brothers of the Serpent abridged version of this book. So here we go. The search begins. When I first began researching the origins of human warfare, certainly the furthest thing from my mind were unidentified flying objects, better known as UFOs. The many flying saucer magazines which once graced the newsstands were, in my opinion, not worthy of serious consideration. I also did not feel that the UFO UFO phenomenon was terribly important, even if it was evidence of an extraterrestrial race. Solving the down-to-earth problems of war and human suffering seemed so much more important than arguing over, over whether or not little green men from Mars might occasionally be visiting Earth. I began researching this book in 1979. However... My desire to see an end to war arose much earlier in life, at just about the age of eight. Back then, war movies were very popular in my circle of friends. Our favorite game was playing Army. I usually commanded one squad of kids, and my friend David led the opposition. We filled our imaginary battles with the same glamour and altruism we saw on television. We had no greater hero than the late actor Vic Morrow who would gallantly lead his army squad to victory every week on the television series Combat. One Saturday afternoon, I was watching a Hollywood war movie on television. It was like any other war movie, except that it contained a short piece of numbing realism. For the first time in my life, I found myself looking at documentary film footage of an actual Nazi concentration camp. Long after these images vanished off the television screen, I was haunted by the pictures of skeleton-like bodies being thrown into large pits. Like so many other people, I had trouble fathom- fathoming the souls of the Nazis who would, could shove human beings into brick ovens like loaves of bread and moments later pull out charred remains. 
Within a minute, those grainy black and white images presented a true picture of war. Behind the curt salutes and stirring oratory, war is little but degraded psychosis. While war movies and games can sometimes be fun, the real thing is unconscionable. And I agree with this. Like, I play, I'm a gamer. I play plenty of games where you're running around with guns, shooting the stuff and blowing it up. That's fun. But actually doing it in real life is a completely different thing. And I think that's, I don't know. To me, that seems obvious. But, you know, sometimes you hear in the news, like, they're trying to blame violence on video games or they blame violence on music or something. And I'm, I'm just like, no. I play a lot of games where you're blowing stuff up and shooting it, and I would not want to do that in real life. But it's fun to do it as a game. You don't yeah. think you're desensitized at all? No. No. Okay. That's good. That's good. Yeah, no. Because I know it's a game, right? <laughs> it's like you're not actually – it's like playing chess. In chess, you're actually killing the other pieces, but does it desensitize you to, to killing things? No, but it teaches you tactics and thinking. And, yeah. You know, it's entertaining because it's a game. But yeah. it is a battle. Chess is a battle. Checkers is a battle. Every game you play practically yeah. is some kind of We game. play poker with poker chips, but it doesn't desensitize you to throwing cash on a table in a casino. Right. Yeah. When you actually get to the cash, you're like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. yeah. That's true. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty clear what the real thing is. So, yeah. For centuries, scientists and thinkers have attempted to solve the riddle of why people go to war. They have observed that nearly all of Earth's creatures fight amongst themselves at one time or another, usually over food, territory, or mating. Aggression seems to be a universal behavior related to survival. Other factors also contribute to the creation of wars. The analyst must take into consideration such variables as human psychology, sociology, political leadership, economic conditions, and the natural surroundings. Many thinkers, however, have erroneously equated all human motives with motives found in the animal kingdom. This is a mistake because intelligence breeds complexity. As creatures rise in intelligence, their motivations tend to become more elaborate. It is easy to understand the mental stimuli in two alley cats squabbling over a scrap of food, but it would be a mistake to attribute as simple a state of mind to a terrorist planting a bomb in an airport. I began this study as the result of a single idea I had encountered. The concept is certainly not a new one, and at first it seems narrow in scope. The idea is nevertheless quite important because it addresses a motivation which can real only be formulated by creatures of high intelligence. War can be its own valuable commodity. The simple existence of violent conflicts between groups of people can in itself be valuable to someone regardless of the issues over which people are fighting. An obvious example is an armaments manufacturer selling military hardware to warring nations or a lending institution making loans to governments during wartime. Both can achieve an economic benefit from the mere existence of war as long as the violence does not directly touch them. The value of war as a commodity extends well beyond monetary gain. <clears throat> war can be an effective tool for maintaining social and political control over large populations. In the 16th century, Italy consisted of numerous independent principalities, which were often at war with one another. When a prince conquered a neighboring city, he would sometimes breed internal conflicts amongst the vanquished citizens. This was an effective way to maintain political control over the people because the endless, endless squabbling prevented the vanquished people from engaging in unified action against the conqueror. It did not greatly matter over what issues the people bickered so long as they valiantly struggled against one another and not against the conquering prince. A state of war can also be used to encourage populations to think in ways that they would otherwise not do and to accept the formation of institutions that they would normally reject. The longer a nation involves itself in wars, the more entrenched those institutions and ways of thinking will become. Most comprehensive history books contain brief references to this type of manipulative third-party activity. It is no secret, for example, that prior to the American Revolution, France had sent intelligence agents to America to stir up colonial discontent against the British crown. <clears throat> it is also no secret that the German military had aided Lenin and the Bolsheviks in the Russian Revolution of 1917. Throughout all of history, people and nations have benefited from and have contributed to the existence of other people's conflicts. Intrigued by these concepts, I resolved to do a study to determine just how important the third-party factor has been in human history. I wanted to discover what common threads, if any, may have existed between the various third-party influences in history. 
It was my hope that this study would offer added insights into how and by whom history has been made. What resulted from this modest goal was one of the most extraordinary odysseys I have ever taken. The trail of investigation wove through a complex labyrinth of remarkable facts, startling theories, and everything in between. As I dug ever deeper, a common thread did emerge. To my chagrin, it was a thread so bizarre that on at least two occasions, I terminated the research in disgust. <laughs> I really like where this is going. Yeah. <laughs> As I pondered my predicament, I realized something important. Rational minds tend to seek rational causes to explain human problems. As I probed deeper, however, I was compelled to face the possibility that some human problems may be rooted in some of the most utterly bizarre realities imaginable. Because such realities are rarely acknowledged, let alone understood, they are not dealt with. As a result, the problems those realities generate are rarely resolved, and so the world seems to stumble from one calamity to the next. I will admit that when I began my research, I had a bias about what I was expecting to find, a human profit motive as the common thread which links various third-party influences in mankind's violent history. What I found instead was the UFO, and nothing could have been more unwelcome. <laughs> so yeah, that was basically his intro there. So now, orientation. And this is, again, I have to read this entire thing because it orients you to the, all the premises throughout the book. <clears throat> so, hello and welcome. This is our planet Earth. Before starting our journey through history, let us take a brief look at our little space orb from the vantage point of newcomers undergoing a brief orientation. Spaceship Earth, as some people like to call it, is a relatively small celestial body. The American Space Shuttle can completely orbit the Earth in only 90 minutes. In modern aircraft, the crossing of once formidable oceans has become little more than a dull routine for many an airborne business person plying his or her trade between continents. By merely picking up a telephone and dialing, one can speak instantly to someone on the opposite side of the globe. We are all witness to the remarkable manner in which high-speed travel and telecommunications make contact between dis distant points on Earth quickly and easily manageable. Na uh, manageable. Earth is not only small, it is also quite remote. If you and I were to take a position outside of the Milky Way galaxy, we would see that Earth is near the galaxy's outer edge. In addition, the Milky Way is dwarfed by much larger galaxies. This isolated location might help explain why Earth has so few contacts with extraterrestrial civilizations, if such civilizations do exist. Earth is afloat in the distant boondocks of a minor galaxy. <laughs> Despite its isolation, Earth is pretty, and it is, and it is inhabited. As of this writing, the human population numbers over 5 billion people. Add to that the figure of all the other large mammals, and we find that the lands and waters of Earth are occupied by an enormous population of intelligent and semi-intelligent creatures. What kind of animals are human beings? As a student of biology can quickly tell you, humans constitute that animal species known as Homo sapiens. The, work, the word homo comes from the Latin word for man, and sapiens means being wise or sensible. The label Homo sapiens therefore denotes a creature possessed of wisdom or sensibility. Most Homo sapiens do live up to their title, by and large, although a small number obviously do not. <laughs> when dealing with a human being, are we only confronting an animal? As it turns out, we are not. It appears that we are faced with something much more important, a spiritual being. The idea that there is spiritual reality to life is ageless. Some religions have held the belief for millennia that human bodies are mere puppets animated by spiritual beings. Often accompanying this tenet are doctrines concerning reincarnation or an afterlife. In the Christian religion, the word soul has long been used to denote a spiritual entity which survives the death of the physical body. Some people claim that an ancient wisdom about the spirit had once existed, if such a wisdom did ever exist... It long ago became hopelessly bemuddled by countless false ideas, strange mystical beliefs and practices, incomprehensible symbolism, and erroneous scientific teachings. As a result, the subject of the spirit is today almost unstudiable. On top of that, many scholars trained in Western scientific methods reject the idea of, ins of a soul entirely, apparently because they cannot put a spirit under a microscope and watch it wiggle or plant electrodes in it and give it a jolt. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> As good fortune would have it, some breakthroughs on the subject have been made within recent decades. Evidence that every person is a unique spiritual being is strong indeed. Volumes of fascinating testimony have been gathered from people who have undergone so-called near-death experiences. 
During such episodes, many people undergo the sensation of leaving their bodies, especially as their bodies approach death. Some psychiatrists argue that this phenomenon is nothing more than a self-protective illusion of the mind. But it is not as simple as that. Many near-death victims are able to perceive their bodies from an accurate exterior perspective. They retain their complete self-awareness and personal identity even though their bodies are unconscious. In light of such testimony, it is not surprising that a few religions, such as Buddhism, believe that people are immortal spiritual beings which become enmeshed in bodies during life. Buddhists conclude that this is caused, at least in part, by the spirit's long-term interaction with the physical universe. In sharp contrast to psychiatric theory, Buddhists teach that the spiritual separation from the body is the healthiest state for human beings. And Buddhists seek to attain that separation without suffering physical trauma or death. <clears throat> Their goal is encouraged by the belief that a spiritual being can operate a body as well or even better from outside the body as from within. That's pretty cool. Hmm. The definition of a spiritual being shared by several religions appears to be the most accurate one. A spiritual being is an entity possessed of awareness, of creativity, and personality. It is not composed of matter or of any other component of the physical universe. It appears instead to be an immortal unit of awareness, which cannot perish, although it can become entrapped by physical matter. The spiritual being is fully capable of understanding itself. The modern trend, of course is to view the brain as the center of awareness and personality. Scientists have been able to electrically stimulate specific parts of the brain to produce the physiological manifestation of many human emotions. This, however, reveals the brain to be nothing more than a sophisticated switchboard capable of being activated by a variety of external sources, such as by an experimenter with his electrodes, or perhaps by a spirit with its own energy output. <laughs> The interaction between a spiritual entity and the body's central nervous system appears to be so intimate that a change in one can often influence the behavior of the other. From all this emerges a picture of a indica indicating that human beings are spiritual entities who enjoy certain spiritual immortality, but who are usually unaware of it until an unexpected separation occurs. <clears throat> During life, <clears throat> spiritual beings tend to utilize almost exclusively the perceptions of the physical body. Death, according to this analysis, is little more than the spiritual abandonment of the body during a time of intense physical or sometimes mental injury. What does all this have to do with human warfare? Almost everything, as we shall see. That brings us to the third and final topic of our orientation, UFOs. There are few subjects today as full of false information, deceit, and madness as flying saucers. Many earnest people who attempt to study the subject are driven around in circles by a terrific amount of dishonesty from a small number of people who, for the sake of a fleeting moment of notoriety or with the deliberate intention to obfuscate, have clouded the field with false reports, untenable explanations, and fraudulent evidence. Suffice it to say that behind this smokescreen there is ample evidence of extraterrestrial visitations to Earth. This is too bad. An in-depth study of the UFO phenomenon reveals that it does not offer a happy little romp through the titillating unknown. The UFO appears more and more to be one of the grimmest realities ever confronted by the human race. Keeping these points of our brief orientation in mind, let us now begin a deeper probe. All right. UFOs, truth or fiction? UFOs, what are they and where did they come from? Strictly speaking, the term unidentified flying object refers to any aerial object which cannot be positively identified as a man-made construction or as any known phenomenon of nature. The term implies a mystery. In common parlance, UFO is often used to denote any object which might be a spacecraft from an extraterrestrial civilization. The phrase unidentified flying object was coined by U.S. Air Force Captain Edward J. Ruppelt. Captain Ruppelt led an Air Force investigation into the phenomenon in 1951. Prior to his investigation, UFOs were usually called flying saucers because many eyewitnesses described the object as objects as disc-shaped. Flying saucer but quickly became a term of derision, however, due to the skepticism expressed by many newspaper and magazine writers. Unidentified flying object was used by the captain to lend his Air Force study an air of respectability. UFO is also a more accurate term because not all unidentified flying objects are saucer-shaped. Hundreds of UFOs are reported every year, usually to police, the news media, or to UFO research groups. 
These reports represent only a minority of the total number of UFOs actually seen because most UFO witnesses do not publicly reveal their encounters. Roughly 90 to 95 percent of all reported UFOs prove to be man-made aircraft or <clears throat> unrecognized natural phenomena. Approximately 1.5 to 2 percent are outright hoaxes, often accompanied by spurious photographs. Although hoaxes constitute such a small percentage of all UFO reports, they have created a disproportionate amount of trouble. Hoaxes are, in fact, responsible for almost entirely disgracing the serious study of UFOs. The more convincing the fraud, the more damage it will usually do. The remaining 3 to 8.5% of all UFO sightings are those which appear to be aircraft of non-human origin. Most researchers are concerned with this last group. 20th century UFOs were rarely reported in the mass media before 1947, and so some people assume that UFOs must be a relatively modern phenomena. UFOs are, in fact, quite the opposite. They have been reported for thousands of years in all parts of the world. For example, writer Julius of Sequins reproduced the following account from 216 BC in his book, uh, Prodigorium Liber. Quote, Things like ships were seen in the sky over Italy. At Apri in Italy, a round shield was seen in the sky. And at Capua, the sky was all on fire, and one saw figures like ships, unquote. That's from <laughs> wow. 216 BC. <clears throat> Crackpot! <laughs> <clears throat> In the first century AD, famed Roman statesman Cicero recorded a night sighting during which the sun, accompanied by loud noises, were re was reportedly seen in the night sky. The sky appeared to split open and reveal strange spheres. UFOs became so troublesome in the 8th and 9th centuries that Emperor Charlemagne of France was compelled to issue edicts forbidding them from per per uh, perturbing the air and provoking storms. <laughs> <laughs> he writes a law. UFOs are not allowed in the sky. <laughs> in one episode, some of Charlemagne's subjects were taken up in aerial ships, shown marvels, and then returned to Earth, only to be put to death by an angry mob. Those troublesome ships were even accused of destroying crops. Uh, Crop circles? Yeah. <laughs> oh, and here's a, there's a footnote here. A long and interesting collection of ancient UFO sightings and unusual natural phenomena from the late B.C. and early A.D. years can be found in Harold T. Wilkins' book, Flying Saucers on the Attack. Despite its sensationalist title, this book is often well argued and is worth reading as one of the earliest books of the modern UFO area, era. And an excellent collection of ancient UFO reports can also be found in Jacques Vallée's Passport to Magonia, which I definitely reckon recommend that one. Jacques Vallée is probably in my mind he's one of he's the best one of the best UFO researchers that's ever existed. Real scientific mind, written a lot of books. His uh passport to, or his uh messengers of deception changed my life in terms of the whole UFO picture. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. UFOs have not only been seen, they have also been worshiped throughout history. The religions of ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the Americas were dominated by the adoration of human-like gods from the heavens. Many of those gods were said to travel about in flying boats and or globes. Ancient claims of that kind are today the basis of modern ancient astronauts theory, which postulates that a space-age race had once visited Earth and had involved itself in human affairs. Some UFO researchers have gone a step further by suggesting that such a space-age race had either created or conquered human society many thousands of years ago, and that it is been maintaining a watchful eye on its possession ever since. To many, uh, to many, such theories seem to be the stuff of science fiction. The ideas are, however, one outgrowth of an academic debate which has preoccupied historians for over a century. How did the ancient, old, and new world civilizations located on opposites of the Earth come to so closely resemble one another? Why did the peoples of those far-flung civilizations develop such remarkably similar religious beliefs? One widely held view is that a land or ice bridge once spanned the Bering Strait between Siberia and Alaska over which people from the Old World had migrated into the New. Others point to archaeological evidence that the ancient Phoenicians had sailed across the Atlantic Ocean centuries before the Scandinavian Vikings or Christopher Columbus. Some scholars conclude that the Phoenicians had borrowed many features of the Egyptian civilization and had transplanted them to the New World. Another hypothesis is that the ancient Egyptians themselves had sailed across the Atlantic. Despite evidence to support all of the above poss possibilities, none of the theories fully encompass all of the known facts. 
This has led to a fourth theory, well expressed in 1910 by Oxford professor and Nobel laureate Frederick Soddy. Quote, Some of the beliefs and legends bequeathed to us by antiquity are so universally and firmly established that we have become accustomed to consider them, consider them as being almost as ancient as humanity itself. Nevertheless, we are tempted to inquire how far the fact that some of these beliefs and legends have so many features in common is due to chance, and whether the similarity between them may not point to the existence of an ancient, totally unknown, and unexpected civilization of which all other traces have disappeared. Mm. Man. Well said, sir. <laughs> When such conjecture is raised, many people think of vanished land masses or islands, such as the legendary lost continents of Atlantis or Lemuria. But one of Professor Saudi's contemporaries, however, took a different approach and speculated that extraterrestrial societies were involved in Earth's prehistory. Dr. Saudi's controversial contemporary was Charles Hoy Fort. Yeah, Charles Fort. This guy was awesome. Charles Ford is perhaps the earliest writer of the 20th century to seriously suggest that extraterrestrials have been involved in human affairs. Ford su supported himself on a small inheritance and spent many years of his adult life amassing reports of unusual phenomena from scientific journals, newspapers, and magazines. The stories we he collected were of such events as unusual moving lights in the sky, rainfalls of animals, and other occurrences which seemed to defy conventional scientific explanation. His first two books, The Book of the Damned and New Lands, contain a large assortment of UFO sightings and related phenomena from the 19th and early 20th centuries. Fort concluded that Earth skies were hosting an array of extraterrestrial aircraft, which he called super constructions. <laughs> <laughs> Fort developed other theories from his research, several of which have endured and still remain provocative today. In The Book of the Damned, he wrote, quote, I think we're property. I should say, we belong to something. That once upon a time, this earth was no man's land, that other worlds explored and colonized here and fought among themselves for possession, but that now it is owned by something. That something owns this earth, all others are warned off, unquote. <clears throat> That's freaky. Yeah. Fort concluded that the human race does not have a very high status in relation to Earth's extraterrestrial owners. In addressing the puzzle of why don't they, the Earth's owners, ever come here or send here openly, he philosophized, quote, Would we, if we could, educate and sophisticate pigs or geese or cattle? Would it be wise to establish diplomatic relation with the hen that now functions satisfied with mere sense of achievement by way of compensation? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> In addition to likening the human race to self-satisfied <laughs> livestock, Fort believed that a direct influence over human affairs was being exerted by Earth's apparent owners. Quote, I suspect that, after all, we are useful. That among contesting claimants, adjustment has occurred, or that something now has a legal right to us by force, or by having paid out analogs of beads for us to former, more primitive owners of us, that all of this has been known, perhaps for ages, to certain ones, Upon this earth, a cult or an order, members of which function like bellwethers to the rest of us, or as superior slaves or overseers, directing us in accordance with instructions received from somewhere else in our mysterious usefulness, unquote. Managers. What? Managers. Yeah. Yeah. Freaking longheads. <laughs> Fort did not speculate as to what mankind's mysterious usefulness not usefulness might be, except to briefly suggest that humans might be slaves. In a lighter vein, Fort thought that Earth had a very lively and colorful prehistory. Quote, But I accept that in the past, before proprietorship was established, inhabitants of a host of other worlds have dropped here, hopped here, wafted, sailed, flown, motored, walked here for all I know, and been pulled here, been pushed, have come singly, have come in enormous numbers, have visited occasionally, have visited periodically for hunting, trading, replenishing, harems, mining, have been unable, unable to stay here, have established colonies here, have been lost here, far advanced peoples or things, and primitive peoples or whatever they were, white ones, black ones, yellow ones, and all colors. Unquote. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> to understand how all of this applies to, human to the human condition today, Fort offered no answer answers, only a formula. Quote, pigs, geese, and cattle. First find out that they are owned, then they find out the whyness of it. 
unquote. Yeah. So, I mean, if you think of it in that terms, like, do, do hens ever figure out <laughs> that they're owned? You know, I mean, right. it's hard to tell. Yeah. You know, cattle, I mean, you know, we we do what we want with them. Like, they're useful to us, and we kind of keep them happy. Build fences. Most of the time, yeah, we build fences, which they probably don't like, but they may not know what they are. Right. But you some know. people really love their cows, so Yeah, that. for sure, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. But most of the cows don't have somebody that really, really, really loves them. That yeah. you know, they're just. I mean, they're just useful. Yeah, they're useful. So you, you take care of them because they're useful. Yeah. But only to the extent that they're useful. You know, it isn't like a pet where you just lavish it with everything and it doesn't have to do anything for you, right? Yeah, that's a whole nother level. Right. And I'm sure that you know, Ford is implying in this previous thing that, that that's also been the case as well. That humans can be pets in which they are lavishly given all kinds of stuff just because. But most of humans have been. But is it really just because? Well, I don't know. I mean, like the usefulness of a pet is that it makes you happy. But right? maybe those humans are really treated extra special. Yeah. Because he wants them to do something extra special. Right. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fort had certainly expressed some daring ideas. <clears throat> they were published at a time when crude biplanes and dirigible balloons ruled the sky. Charles Lindenberg's historic flight across the Atlantic Ocean was still eight years away. Fort acquired a small and loyal following during his day, but it was not until the thir a third of a century later that the foundation laid by Fort supported a sudden explosion of nonfiction works, speculating that an extraterrestrial society had been involved in human affairs. This sudden surge of interest was caused by a media-publicized rash of UFO sightings in the late 1940s and 1950s. One of the first books of that period to discuss ancient UFO sightings was Flying Saucers on the Attack by Harold T. Wilkins. It was published in 1954 by Citadel Press of New York. Citadel followed with a host of books, including The UFO and the Bible, 1956, by Morris K. Jessup. Jessup's book suggested that many biblical events were the doings of a space age race, not of a god. Numerous passages from the Bible were quoted to support this theory. Similar books with similar titles followed, such as Flying Saucers in the Bible by Virginia F. Brassington and The Bible and Flying Saucers by Barry H. Downing. <laughs> <laughs> On the other side of the Atlantic, a number of European writers were also making important contributions to the genre. The French writing team of Louis uh, Powells and Jacques Bergier wrote their intriguing bestseller, Morning of the Magicians, which was published in the Americas in the early 1960s. Eric von Daniken of Switzerland was also writing about ancient astronauts during the 1950s and 60s, and he achieved great fame by the early 70s after the publication of his first international bestseller, Chariots of the Gods. The powerful success of von Daniken's book prompted a flood of similar books and motion pictures in the 70s and early 80s, bringing the idea of ancient astronauts to the attention of millions. And of course, later, ancient aliens to right. like pretty much everybody in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The notion of, ancient, of alien intervention in human affairs is generally tolerated when it is expressed as a work of science fiction, but it is often poorly received when suggested as fact. This is understandable. The very idea of it seems, at first blush, to fly in the face of everything we have ever been taught. For centuries, there has been a strong tendency to think of our planet and the human race in very isolationist terms. I agree with that. Like, yep. cosmos does not come into it, right? Centuries ago, people even believed that the humans were at the center of the universe and that the sun and stars all revolved around us. It was a flattering notion, but sadly not a true one. In the bygone days of the Inquisition, however, a person could be put to death for challenging the idea. The only extraterrestrials people were permitted to believe in were winged angels in white robes sent from heaven by the great gods. <clears throat> Although the sciences have thankfully moved away from that kind of perspective to a large extent, human-centered uh, human centered concepts of existence are still surprisingly strong. Some persuasive-sounding arguments have been advanced to refute the evidence that one or more extraterrestrial societies have been visiting the Earth, and some of these arguments are worth addressing. So now he's going to... There's a whole... I think he goes through 11 points that he argues against. So, one... No, one, These are the arguments that people make, and then he's going to 
talk about them. So one, no intelligent life other than mankind has ever been proven to exist elsewhere in the universe. At first glance, this seems to be true. However, one need only look right here on Earth to find other intelligent life. <laughs> <laughs> Studies of dolphins and other large marine animals have revealed high intelligence in many of these creatures. Analysis of other mammals have uncovered in some of them a level of intelligence much higher than previously believed. This reveals that there are a great many intelligent and semi-intelligent creatures in the universe known to us, and we share a planet with them. The fact that they all flourish together on this one small planet is an excellent indication that other intelligent creatures can exist elsewhere in the right conditions. Two. There has not been a single UFO sighting which could not be explained as a natural or human phenomena. Therefore, all UFOs must be such phenomena. Yeah, he's, he's basically quoting Skirptards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this argument uses faulty logic. It is possible to explain almost anything as anything. I, I totally agree with this. Just because you can explain something... You know, like like sit in your armchair and explain something with something does not mean that that's how it worked. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yes. Uh, I suppose one could explain the sun as billions of fireflies held in a gigantic glass bowl. <laughs> <laughs> this explanation, however, does not fit the evidence as well as a be as the better theory that the sun is a huge mass of compressed hydrogen, which is undergoing a process of atomic fusion. Yes. Electric Universe people, we hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Many UFO sightings are given prosaic explanations only by ignoring evidence, which clearly reveals that they are not earthly phenomena. If one is selective enough in choosing which evidence and testimony to believe, one can invent almost any explanation, explanation to fit almost any UFO sighting. The trick is to find the best explanation to fit the true and complete facts. In many instances, the true and complete facts indicate that a UFO is indeed best explained as a natural phenomenon. In other cases, the best explanation is that a UFO is probably an intelligently guided craft of non-human origin. Many remarkable sightings do fit this latter category. <clears throat> Three. There has been no hard evidence of UFOs or ancient astronauts. Physical objects constitute hard evidence. In ufology, a piece of hard evidence might be a crashed saucer or the body of an extraterrestrial pilot. It is argued that if alien spacecraft had been flying in Earth's skies for thousands of years, we should have a piece of concrete physical evidence by now. Setting aside allegations and evidence that some governments may have a crashed saucer or two secreted away, <laughs> we cannot logically expect to find too many alien artifacts. To explain why, I'll make an, anal an analogy between UFOs and modern commercial jetliners. Millions! of commercial airline flights take off from U.S. airports every year. Despite this enormous volume, very few people will ever stumble upon a crashed jetliner or dead crew member, because only a tiny percentage of all flights end in disaster. Equally few individuals will ever find any instruments or debris tossed from jetliners, because jetliners are self-contained and the navigators rarely gouge instruments from the flight panels and heave them out the windows. If it were not for the fact that most of us can see commercial jet aircraft and fly in them, the hard evidence of their existence would be surprisingly scant, even if they were to be manufactured in and flown only to and from remote, uh, or especially if they were manufactured in and flown to and from remote areas. So let us translate this into mathematical formulas. Based on U.S. Federal Aviation Administration statistics, roughly one in every million flights by major U.S. carriers departing from American airports suffers a serious accident such as a crash a crash landing away from an airport, or the loss of a significant piece of the plane. This admirable safety record makes air travel one of the safest modes of transportation today. Let us assume that the reported alien spacecraft in our skies have precisely the same safety record as American commercial jet aircraft, no better or worse. Let us guess that 2,000 flying saucer flights are made over Earth every year. That amounts to five and a half flights every day. We will assume that each hypothetical saucer flight is made at a low enough altitude that if a mishap should occur, the debris would fall to Earth before disintegrating. Putting all of the above figures together, we discover that a flying saucer would crash or drop a substantial chunk of debris only once every 500 years. <laughs> oh my god. That would amount to only 12 crashes since the dawn of mankind's first recorded civilization. 
If we cut the safety factor in half and double the number of hypothetical UFO flights to 4,000 per year or 11 per day, or leave the safety factor the same and quadruple the number of low-level saucer flights to 8,000 per year or 22 per day, that would still amount to only one crash or major piece of debris once every 125 years. We can safely conclude that even if extraterrestrial craft have been flying in our skies for thousands of years, we cannot expect to find too much wreckage or debris. The best evidence of extraterrestrial visitation that we may reasonably expect to obtain is eyewitness testimony, which is precisely the evidence we have. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. We should uh, take a break. All right. Cool, cool. And uh, obviously this was written before Gebekli Tepe was found. Yes, it was. Yeah. Because he's basically saying since the beginning of... Yeah, he's talking about Sumer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Thanks. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Brothers of the Serpent podcast. This is the second hour. First segment. Watcher yeah. still has not joined us. Yeah. Sadly. Hope, hope everything's okay. We are going through William Bramley's The Gods of Eden. And we're going through his... And this was written in 1970s? What did you say it was? Uh, it was the first publication was... 1993. Oh, 93. Okay. But the copyright is 89 and 90, so that's probably when he finished finished the... the, the okay. He started his research in the 70s. 70, so. yeah, 79. Yeah, so the first, first Avon Books printing was in March 1993. Yeah. Okay. So we're going through this whole... Uh, the argument that he's talking about here is there's no hard evidence of UFOs and ancient astronauts. Right. That's right. <clears throat> um... So he says, the best evidence of extraterrestrial visitation that we may reasonably expect is to obtain eyewitness testimony, which is precisely the kind of evidence that we have. Despite these pessimistic stat statistics, a few rare UFO crashes have been reported. Fragments alleged to have been from exploding UFOs have been found and made public. One such piece was reported by a Brazilian columnist who said that the item had been recovered by a fisherman off the coast of Brazil in 1957. The fragment was sent by Omni Magazine to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology for analysis. It proved to be a piece of pure magnesium. An MIT anal uh, analyst guessed that the fragment might have been a piece of weld metal from either an exploding aircraft or from a re-entering satellite. Because the piece could have been manufactured on Earth, the test was considered inconclusive. Very interesting, though. Pure magnesium. Four. This is the fourth script art argument. <laughs> if UFOs are ex extraterrestrial aircraft, there should be an undisputed photograph of one by now. Undisputed. Right. <laughs> he says anything can be disputed. Yeah. To begin a dispute, all one needs to do is open one's <laughs> mouth and utter a few words. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Soul disputes something with us every Five minutes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so he goes on with this about photographs and stuff like that, but I think that that, that first sentence just basically covers that whole argument. Um, okay, five. Fifth, fifth script art argument. Eyewitness testimony in UFO cases is inherently unreliable. Such testimony is therefore insufficient evidence of extraterrestrial visitation. Okay, perhaps the most influential UFO critic as of this writing is Philip Klass who has been aptly dubbed the Sherlock Holmes of ufology for his exhaustive investigations. His book, UFOs Explained, won the Aviation Space Writers Award for Best Book on Space in 1974. In that award-winning book, Mr. Class developed several principles. The first was, quote, ufological principle number one. Basically honest and intelligent persons who are suddenly exposed to a brief, unexpected event, especially one that involves an unfamiliar object, may be grossly inaccurate in trying to describe precisely what they have seen. Unquote. 
This principle is sometimes true. It was demonstrated by a U.S. government-sponsored UFO study conducted between 1966 and 1968 under the direction of Edward U. Condon. Its published findings, which are usually called the Condon Report, are a milestone in UFO literature. In one, in, chap, uh, in one chapter of the Condon Report, the committee discusses what occurred after a Russian spacecraft, the Zond-4, went awry and began its re-entry into Earth's atmosphere on March 3rd, 1968. As the craft fell through the atmosphere and burned, it created a spectacular display for people on the ground. Eyewitnesses perceived the flaming debris as a majestic procession of fiery objects leaving behind a golden orange tail. Because of the object's great height, it was impossible to make out from the ground what the broken pieces actually were. It was only possible to see, see them as brilliant and separate points of light. The Zond 4 debris created an effect identical to that of a brilliant meteor display. Upon compiling witness testimony to, of the Zond 4 re-entry, it was discovered that some people, quote-unquote, saw more than there really was. If some of the erroneous observations had been taken at face value, some people would have concluded that the Zond 4 debris, or debris was actually an intelligently controlled alien spacecraft. For example, five eyewitnesses reported that the lights were part of a cigar shape or rocket-shaped craft, which is a common UFO description. Three eyewitnesses said that the object had windows. One observer claimed that the object had made a vertical descent. Because of these blatant errors, Mr. Class and others have understandably labeled all quote-unquote cigar-shaped UFOs with bright windows as meteors. The Condon Committee cited the Zond 4 testimony as an example of why eyewitness reports are often inadequate to establish that a UFO is an extraterrestrial spacecraft. So, case closed? Not quite. In his ufological principle number one quoted above, Mr. Class states that eyewitnesses may be grossly inaccurate in trying to describe pre precisely what they have seen. Significantly, he did not say that eyewitnesses are usually inaccurate. This distinction takes on importance as we read further into the Condon report. The Condon committee discovered that at least half of the Zond 4 eyewitnesses gave accurate, unembellished reports of this event. The observations of a cigar-shaped craft with windows came from a small minority. From the accurate reports, a careful UFO researcher would have been able to eliminate the erroneous descriptions and correctly identify the Zond 4 re-entry as debris or a mete uh, meteoric phenomenon. The committee also analyzed a wave of UFO reports triggered by several college students who had released four hot air balloons into the evening sky. The balloons were made of plastic dry-cleaning bags, and the hot air was generated by birthday candles suspended underneath. The committee analyzed the testimony of 14 eyewitnesses who did not know what these flying objects were. With only minor deviations among them, all 14 ob observers gave accurate descriptions of what it was, what it was possible for them to actually see. Thus, the committee concluded, quote, In summary, we have a number of reports that are highly consistent with one another, and those differences that do occur are no greater than would be expected from situational or perceptual differences. Many small discrepancies can be pointed out, especially with regard to estimates of distance and direction, but these are not great enough to affect the overall impression of the event, unquote. That's a really cool experiment. Yeah. <clears throat> this demonstrates something very important that we can express in our own ufological principle. Quote, basically honest and intelligent persons who are suddenly exposed to a brief, unexpected event, including one that involves an unfamiliar object, will, in the majority of cases, be accurate in trying to describe precisely what they have seen. Unquote. Cool. That is why eyewitness testimony may be admissible in courts of law to convict or free a defendant even when solid physical evidence is lacking. Eyewitness testimony is a perfectly valid and useful form of evidence. Okay. Sixth Skirptard argument. <laughs> Sophisticated listening devices have been pointed towards the heavens to pick up extraterrestrial communications, and so far no such communications have been detected. This is further evidence that there is no intelligent life anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Despite skepticism in many academic circles regarding extraterrestrial visitation, several well-funded attempts have been made to detect sin signals from outer space civilizations through the use of sophisticated radio antennas pointed towards the heavens. The fact that these efforts have reportedly not detected any intelligent signals is viewed as additional proof that there are no alien civilizations nearby. The problem with drawing such a conclusion is that radio antennas have many limitations. They are only able to detect radio waves. <laughs> this is why they're called radio antennas. There are many other bands along the electromagnetic spectrum that can carry communication signals, such as microwave, 
What is to say that an extraterrestrial society, if it exists, would necessarily use radio for communication? We do not even know what lies beyond the two known ends of the electromagnetic spectrum. I thought this was interesting. Kyle, you yeah. thought, like, what's, what's, why are they in there? What, what's the deal? <laughs> why does it yes. stop? <clears throat> How can we be sure that there are not wavelengths in one of the two uncharted regions which are far superior for communication to anything we have detected so far? The reputed failure of radio antennas to pick up intelligence signals would only tell us that no one within range is using the electromagnetic wavelengths detectable by those antenna. Right. Seventh, skirt dart argument. If so many flying saucers are visiting Earth, then why are they not, not detected more often on radar? Many outstanding UFO sightings have been confirmed on radar. This excellent radar evidence is usually dismissed by critics as operator error, as radar malfunction, or as false readings caused by natural phenomena. We would have even more radar evidence if it were not for the fact that radar operators are trained to disregard most radar anomalies because any number of things can create a false read. Spurious radar signals can be generated by such widely disparate phenomena as flocks of birds and severe weather conditions. Operators are taught to focus on those readings that pinpoint the type of objects that they are tracking, usually human aircraft. If something unusual pops up on the screen and then disappears, it will more often than not be ignored. A great many radar UFOs there go, therefore go unreported. Radar detection of UFOs is being further eliminated by advances in technology. Many modern radar computers now automatically eliminate anomalous readings so that they are not even displayed. This makes an operator's job easier, but at the cost of eliminating UFO detection. Mr. Class comments, quote, Ironically, one of the several criteria, criteria used by radar computers to discriminate between real and spurious targets would filter out potential radar UFOs even if they were legitimate extraterrestrial craft flying at hypersonic speeds, unquote. Okay, eighth skirt dart argument. Many people have testified under hypnosis to being abducted by UFOs. Such testimony is inherently suspect because people who have never been abducted can be coached into creating seemingly realistic ab abduction memories while under hypnosis. <clears throat> if the UFO phenomena consisted solely of occasional odd sights in the sky, it might be easier to dismiss. However, many people have reported being kidnapped by UFO occupants. The abduction experiences tend to be remarkably similar. The victim sees a UFO, usually at night and often in a rural area. He or she is immobilized and taken aboard an alien spacecraft, then given a physical examination lasting an hour or two by alien creatures, and then released. Many abductees do not consciously remember their experiences afterwards. A typical victim may only see a UFO and then suddenly discover that two hours have passed with no recollection of what occurred during the missing time. <clears throat> researchers usually break through this amnesia with hypnosis. Well, not usually, but a lot of people have tried this. It appears that the curious amnesia experienced by so many UFO abductees is deliberately induced by the UFO occupants as a method of preserving the alien's anonymity. Such mental tampering can indeed be done during the infamous and highly publicized mind control experiments of the 1960s and 70s, the American CIA had developed effective techniques to bury memory and induce amnesia. With careful work, however, these buried memories could be recovered. <clears throat> As we shall see later, mental, mental tampering with human victims has been a common activity associated with UFOs all throughout history. To date, an enormous body of fascinating abduction testimony has been gathered. Aspersions have been cast upon it because of various experiments, such as those performed in 1977 at the Anaheim Memorial Hospital in California. It was discovered in Anaheim that individuals who allegedly had little prior knowledge of UFOs could be coached into creating seemingly realistic abduction memories while under hypnosis. This discovery has been used to cast doubt on the validity of all abduction testimony obtained under hypnosis. I, I've always thought that, like, so you can say, okay, so these people who have never had any UFO experience, you take them in there, you hypno hypnotize them, and then you can sort of coach them into what you know having these memories i'm like okay so either that means that these memories are more suspect or everyone has been abducted by you right that's what i was gonna say yeah <laughs> they <laughs> were really effective <laughs> yeah in making them forget right they had most of the time the forget the the amnesia is complete right <laughs> yeah so I'm just saying that the t there's two ways to take yeah, that. Everybody I has. Yeah. Everybody has to go up and get stamped <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and then comes back down. Yeah. 
Okay. <clears throat> the Anaheim experiments, however, miss the point and reveal nothing about the UFO phenomena. They only reaffirm what we already know about hypnosis. It is true that a person's memory can be distorted while he is under hypnosis, just as it can when a person is completely conscious. On the other hand, it has been amply demonstrated that hypnosis can be effective in recovering completely <clears throat> valid memories. It depends upon the skill of the hypnotist and the mental state of the subject. A hypnotist can coach a person who has never been aboard a train into creating a realistic memory of riding a train. But does that mean that every hypnotic subject who remembers being on a train is guilty of fabrication? Of course not. Yeah. Just because you can make somebody have the memory under hypnosis does not mean that other memories like that are false. Like right. It's just... Yeah. <clears throat> Admittedly, there are genuine problems with hypnosis. Because the hypnotic subject is in a semi-conscious state, he or she may be more impressionable than normal. For this reason, American courts of law generally do not admit into evidence testimony obtained under hypnosis. Another danger with hypnosis is that a subject may recover a completely valid memory, but if the subject is continuously pushed during hypnosis to remember more, he may find his mental time track getting scrambled. When that happens, he will often start to, quote-unquote, remember additional episodes which did, which did not actually occur uh, when or how remembered. Even so, the original memory does remain valid. Sadly, some UFO abductees have been hypnotized and re-hypnotized beyond all measure of reason. They consequently wind up with scrambled memories on the already highly charged subject of their abductions. For this and other reasons, I strongly recommend against the use of hypnosis. Heavily occluded memory can and should be recovered while a subject is in a fully conscious state. Some UFO abduction experiences have been recovered in just that fashion. Okay, Skirptard argument number nine. The mathematical odds of an extraterrestrial race discovering Earth are, are too remote for it to be likely. <laughs> Stacks of assumptions there. <laughs> Several mathematical formula have been devised to show how unlikely it is that Earth has been visited by an extraterrestrial society. <clears throat> Such formulae are usually based upon theories of evolution, the number of planets which might support life, and the distances between planets and galaxies. Such formulae are certainly interesting, but they should never be considered conclusive. If something exists, it exists. Trying to make it go away with math will not make it any less real. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Keep in mind that we are unable to see any solid planets beyond our own solar system. Okay, so this is before all the exoplanet discoveries. Let alone determine if there is any life on them. The human situation in this respect may be likened to a colony of tiny ants whose range of observation may encompass a few acres. If that colony is situated on a barren desert, these ants might conclude that the entire Earth is a desolate wasteland, never dreaming of the vast metropolis only 100 miles away. Simply because we find our own solar system or section of the galaxy barren, it does not automatically follow that this is the case everywhere. Another sector of the galaxy may be absolutely teeming with intelligent life, and there would be no way for us out here on the distant edge of the Milky Way to know, except by guessing with theories that are ever-changing. For this reason, it is not particularly wise to disregard evidence of extraterrestrial visitation if it appears. Okay. Argument number 10. Only people with mental problems believe in UFOs. I've seen this so many times. One unfortunate method of some UFO critics used to attack evidence of extraterrestrial visitation is with psychological theory. <clears throat> because such a critic is absolutely certain that there have been no extraterrestrial aircraft in our skies, he may resort to using defamatory psychological labels in an effort to explain why many people will consider a possibility that the critic rejects. Such labels have run the gamut from a simple need for religious fulfillment to ambulatory schizophrenia. This dubious, dubious psychiatry has become regrettably fashionable in recent years. It hides the reality that most serious re research into UFOs is as clinical and scientific as one could hope for. The majority of UFO researcher, researchers are as sane and rational as the critics who are quick to bandy about the unflattering psychological labels. The true UFO debate centers around genuine scientific, intellectual, and historical issues, not emotional ones. Another problem with using psychological quote-unquote analysis to quote-unquote explain popular and scientific interest in UFOs is that the tables can be turned. A scholar advocating the possibility of extraterrestrial visitation can as easily and incorrectly argue that those people who adamantly adhere only to prosaic explanations for UFO sightings in the face of contrary evidence are deeply afraid of something they cannot understand. 
Between the distinguished sideburns of a PhD, one could argue, may be a frightened child or a willful adolescent desperately trying to handle the often confusing world around him by forcing everything to conform to what he can intellectually and emotionally comprehend. And I've seen that <laughs> argument, too. <clears throat> On the one side, they're saying that everybody who looks at this is crazy. Yeah. And then on the other side, they're saying that everybody who thinks that this is bullshit are afraid. Right. There's, it's yeah. Yeah. classic. As we can see, psychological mudslinging is very poor form in scientific debate of this kind. <clears throat> it does no one any good. The labels are usually untrue and it clouds the real issues. Intelligent and rational people are easily found on all sides of this controversy. OK. Argument 11. <clears throat> UFO theories are money-making rackets designed to prey on the gullible. It is a truism that there are two great crimes in our society, having money and not having money. Both are punished with equal ferocity. <laughs> 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 One of the easiest ways to discredit an idea is to suggest that someone has gotten money for expressing it. Some UFO critics have made allusions to charlatans in the past who have duped people with strange ideas and who had become rich by preying on other people's gullibility. Such allusions have been made in an effort to suggest that people who earn money from UFO books or motion pictures are engaged in similar chicanery. Please keep in mind that money itself has nothing to do with the validity of an idea. Money is an unpredictable commodity which goes to the deserving and undeserving alike. A handful of people have indeed earned good incomes from books and films dealing with the UFO phenomena, the number of people who have done so, however, is very small compared to the many thousands of teachers, lecturers, and writers who are paid, sometimes handsomely, to promulgate more conventional views of the world. <clears throat> yep. And it's chicanery. Chicanery? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Even when it is clear that a few individuals have falsely reported or insincerely discussed UFOs to make money, the UFO phenomenon is not automatically discredited. Profit-making has been a motive in nearly all arenas of a human endeavor since the earliest days of mankind. If we were to throw out everything to which someone has ever attached a profit motive, little would remain. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, the vast majority of UFO witnesses and researchers, rich and poor, are sincere in what they say and do. Okay, argument 12. UFO behavior does not conform to what we think intelligent extra extraterrestrial behavior ought to be. <laughs> UFOs are difficult to study due to their often bizarre and unpredictable natures. UFO behavior seems, on the one hand, to raise some of the most profound questions about life and existence, while on the other hand, it seems to be the stuff of a Buck Rogers movie. This duality is difficult to reconcile, yet it is an inescapable part of the phenomena. The UFO is both profound and kooky, as we shall see. This factor is often used to discredit UFO reports. Some critics imply that if UFOs are extraterrestrial aircraft, they would manifest themselves in a more acceptable manner. Why, for example, have UFOs apparently kidnapped housewives and implanted them with religious messages, but have never landed on the White House lawn and spoken to the president? In one of his books, Philip Class offered $10,000 for conclusive proof of extraterrestrial visitation. I hate this kind of... These, this you know, kind of chicanery? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to qualify for the reward, only a crash spacecraft or other, other evidence which the U.S. National Academy of Sciences announces to be an affirmation of extraterrestrial intelligence would suffice, or an extraterrestrial visitor must appear before the United Nations General Assembly or on national television program. The fact that no one has received the reward is viewed by some people as added proof that the Earth is not being visited by an extraterrestrial society. The problems with the $10,000 reward are quickly obvious. We have already discussed the poor odds of finding a crashed saucer or major piece of debris. What if the National Academy of Sciences is prone to argue a terrestrial origin to a smaller piece of hard evidence before admitting a non-terrestrial source? What if extraterrestrial pilots are more, no more inclined to appear on television or at the United Nations than a human pilot is disposed to address a council of chimps? We can all certainly wish that UFOs would be more cooperative, but until they are, the UFO phenomena must be studied on its own terms, not according to the behavior we think it ought to exhibit. Also, as this footnote here, he says, another problem with the $10,000 offer was that a person had to pay Mr. Class $100 a year to qualify. What? <laughs> yeah. So you I, had to... I'm going to offer $10,000. <laughs> yeah. To the coolest person in the world. Yeah. All they have to do is just come forward to get the 10,000 bucks. <laughs> right. <laughs> It'll never happen. Mm -hmm. Cuz the coolest guy in the world 
will be so cool. <laughs> he won't even want the ten thousand dollars. <laughs> but you can also view that as proof that no one is cool, right? No, That's he true. was so cool, babe. He got it last year. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Not for me, he didn't. <laughs> he got it before it was cool, before it happened. <laughs> that would be the, the coolest hipster in the mm. world. You're right, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> that's the oxymoron. Cool hipsters? Come on. All right. Uh, okay, argument 13. In the past, a few UFO sightings touted as proof of extraterrestrial visitation by top UFO researchers have proven to be earthly phenomena or hoaxes. <clears throat> Such errors cast doubt on all proclamations by UFO researchers. Because the UFO phenomena is so difficult to study, <clears throat> even the finest researchers will inevitably make errors, and sometimes many of them. It is easy for someone to seize these mistakes and use them to discredit the entire subject. This tactic is often used by lawyers in courts of law, by statesmen during political debates, and even by scientists engaged in academic controversies. <clears throat> the problem with this tactic is that it does not always lead to truth and can definitely lead away from it. A good example was the round earth theory espoused by Christopher Columbus in the 15th century. In an age when many people still believe the world to be flat, Columbus was part of a movement proclaiming the earth was round or pear-shaped. As correct as Columbus was on this issue, he was wrong about many others. Columbus thought that he would encounter Asia when he crossed the Atlantic and falsely reported that he had done so when he returned to Spain. We know today, of course, that Columbus had not found Asia at all. He had stumbled upon the North American continent, which is nowhere near Asia. Because of this, we could easily scoff at Columbus's phony evidence and proclaim his round earth theory is a sham. <clears throat> After all, some of Columbus's other ideas about the earth were clearly wrong, and some of them were absurdly so. This type of situation occurs frequently, especially when science is young, as ufology is today. False claims and erroneous evidence are often used to support fundamentally sound ideas. This is not to say that even every new theory that pops along is a valid one, or that bad evidence is a sign of a good theory. Many theories prove bad. The trick is to weigh all of the evidence and to base a decision on that. In doing so, however, do not be surprised to encounter disagreement from others. It is a funny thing that two people can look at identical information and arrive at opposite conclusions. But yeah, what he was given there was basically an explanation of the, the fallacy of composition, right? Right. Co very common use. All right, argument 14. Expressing theories of extraterrestrial visitation and of ancient astronauts is dangerous to society. This is a this is rarer, but I've still seen this. <clears throat> this argument is not worth dignifying in societies with traditions of open discussion and debate. Freedom of expression is one of the bedrocks of a healthy culture. It allows that society and its people to grow. A wide diversity of ideas gives people more perspectives to choose from. Possessing such a choice is preferable to having intellectual options restricted. In an open society, many unconventional ideas come and go, but that is a small price to pay for the enormous benefits of leaving communication lines open and free. <clears throat> okay. 15. If there are so many UFOs, why have I never seen one? <laughs> Maybe you don't look up Stay at up night. all night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have never seen a UFO either. I have also never seen India, but circumstantial evidence of, of its existence <laughs> tends to make me think that India probably exists. <laughs> In addition to the above arguments, other means have been used to discredit UFO sightings. One method utilizes semantics. Some UFO critics say that they seek to find rational explanations for UFO sightings. By rational, they mean explanations that portray a sighting as a natural or man-made object. This is an unfortunate use of the word rational. The word rational means sane or well thought out or logical. Because sanity and logic must ultimately be based on truth, a rational explanation of a phenomenon would be an explanation that most closely approximates the truth, whatever that truth may be. If a reported UFO is a misperceived natural phenomenon, then to explain it as such would indeed be rational. On the other hand, if a UFO is not a natural or man-made phenomenon, then to say it, that it is in the face of contrary evidence would not be rational at all. Uh, to me, that them using that word is just, it's just a sort of a, like a subtle implication that anybody who doesn't think right. those things is being non-rational, right? It's yeah. just, that's what it is. <clears throat> That's what it's it is. A, it's, a, it's an underhanded insult, yep. basically, is what it is. <clears throat> Having said all this, I still understand the reluctance of many people to take the UFO phenomena seriously. It is a difficult and booby-trapped subject. 
Some individuals who are once open-minded about UFOs have had the unfortunate experience of getting egg in their faces when they over-speculated about UFOs and pr were proven wrong. A good example was the public debacle surrounding the Martian moon Phobos. About a decade ago, a number of scientific opinion leaders had speculated that Phobos was an artificial satellite placed in orbit around Mars by extraterrestrials. When a space probe later flew close enough to photograph Phobos, the Martian moon was shown to be little more than a large, irregular piece of rock, although some of its orbital characteristics remain puzzling. Scientists and astronomers, because they survive on their good reputations, cannot endure too many speculative blunders of that kind. Many people who suffer such a tumble do not get back on the horse. Instead, they curse and attack the beast which threw them. Competent researchers today are aware of these perils, and they try to avoid speculating too far from known facts. So why do I take the possibility of extraterrestrial visitation seriously, even though I agree that the natural explanation for some UFO sightings uh, still debated, de debated today? I do so for many reasons. Firstly, the UFO phenomenon has been observed and reported for many centuries. I therefore reject the critics' contentions that UFOs are merely a bit of modern folklore. Secondly, the UFO phenomena has been surprisingly consistent from location to location and era to era. For example, some modern sightings of rocket or cigar-shaped UFOs mirror a UFO report from 15th century Arabia. Thirdly, although it is true that some dubious ancient astronaut evidence has been published, so has some truly outstanding evidence. The critics' challenge that extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof has, to my mind, been met by some of this evidence. Fourthly, the ancient astronauts' theory is hardly the pseudo-scientific nonsense that it is sometimes accused of being. The ancient astronauts' theory is a surprisingly logical hypothesis for shedding light on previously inexplicable historical data. I expect that it will one day be recognized as a true breakthrough, even if it meets considerable opposition today. The fact that the theory arose from grassroots research and not from the ivied halls of a major university means little. Anyone with an active and curious mind can make significant discoveries. At this stage of my discussion, I may disappoint some readers by stating that it is not my purpose to write yet another tome which analyzes modern UFO sightings or which parades forth an array of ancient astronauts' evidence simply to prove visitation. That has been adequately done elsewhere. If you remain a UFO skeptic, I re recommend that you study other UFO literature before continuing with this book. The Gods of Eden is written for those people who already take seriously the possibility that Earth has been visited by an extraterrestrial society. This book actually begins where Charles Fort left off. Mr. Fort speculated that the Earth may be the property of an extraterrestrial society. He further believed that humans might be little more than slaves or livestock. As a result of my own historical research launched from an entirely different starting point, I too arrived at a similar outrageous theory. And he has a footnote here that says, I had not read any of Charles Fort's works until I had already completed the third draft of this book. Yeah, so he <laughs> got there in a completely different way. So here is his, uh, what he calls a similar outrageous theory. Quote, human beings appear to be a slave race languishing on an isolated planet in a small galaxy. As such, the human race was once a source of labor for an extraterrestrial civilization and still remains a possession today. To keep control over its possession and maintain Earth as something of a prison, that other civilization has bred never-ending conflict between human beings, has promoted human spiritual decay, and has erected on Earth conditions of unremitting physical hardship. This situation has existed for thousands of years and it continues today." Unquote. <clears throat> Having now laid myself wide open to ridicule for expressing such a hypothesis, I will proceed to share with you a very different view of history than you have probably encountered before. Because I am risking a great deal by making this book available, I ask my readers for two favors before they pass judgment on what I have written. One, please read the entire book carefully, and two, please read the chapters in order in, w in the order in which they appear. No idea, fact, or historical episode I present stands entirely on its own. Each becomes significant only when it is seen within the entire context of history. The importance of what you have read early in the book will not become apparent until you have continued to read much further. Conversely, the significance of the latter material will not be clear unless you have read the earlier material first. The first 150 pages or so of this book contains ideas, conclusions, and statements that may seem unscholarly and outrageous. Only by continuing to read onward will the remarkable historical documentation in support of those ideas truly take shape. So hang on to your hat. We will now begin a startling ro ro roller coaster ride along the underbelly of history. 
All right. So that concludes his, basically, that's his introduction to this really enormous book. <laughs> <laughs> Good right. deal. Take a break. Yeah. You must answer to your overlords. <laughs> Brothers of the Serpent Podcast and William Bramley's The Gods of Eden. And we're finally getting into the uh, the first... Uh, the, yeah, the main part of the, the book. main part of the book. So, but, but right before that, uh, Laura texted Dave about this uh, traveling, this sailor... Uh, initiation thing yeah, passing the equator yeah yeah and it's it's a shell back is when you is that when you if come you back across the past if you have crossed over the equator then you have a shell backing ceremony and you're a shell back uh. you're not a polywog anymore <laughs> a polywog <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a turtle but so it's kind of a turtle to shell back yeah <laughs> I mean, lots of things in the ocean are shellbacks. Is there one when you come back across the equator? Or is I it? don't know. Okay, so it's the, it's probably the same. Yeah. All right. Once you've been in both hemispheres here, yeah. the shellback. All right. All right, so props to you shellbacks out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. The Gods of Eden. The idea that human beings are a slave race owned by an extraterrestrial society is not a new one. It was expressed thousands of years ago in mankind's earliest recorded civilizations. The first of those civilizations was Sumeria, a remarkably advanced society which arose in the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley between 5000 and 4000 BC and flourished as a major civilization by 3500 BC. Like other ancient societies which arose in the Mesopotamian region, Sumeria left records stating that human-like creatures of extraterrestrial origin had er ruled early human society as Earth's first monarchs. Those alien people were often thought of as gods. Some Sumerian gods were said to travel into the skies and through the heavens in flying globes and rocket-like vehicles. Ancient carvings depict several gods wearing goggle-like apparel over their eyes. Human priests acted as mere intermediaries between the alien gods and the human population. Not all Mesopotamian gods were human-like extraterrestrials. Some were obvious fabrications, and fictitious attributes were often ascribed to the extraterrestrial human-like gods. Once the blatant fictions are stripped away, however, we discover within the Mesopotamian pa pantheon a distinct class of beings who do, in do indeed fit the ancient astronauts' mold. In order for me to better discuss these high-tech gods, it will be necessary for me to invent a new term. The word God alone contains too much undeserved awe. <laughs> Historical and modern day testimony indicates that these gods are as human in their behavior as you or I. The term ancient astronaut pigeonholes them into the distant past when in fact they appear to have maintained a continuous presence all the way up until today. And the label extraterrestrial is too broad. I cannot name the gods after any star or planet from which they might hail because I will not speculate as, as to their place of origin. Furthermore, it is conceivable that the alleged ownership of Earth may have changed hands over the millennia in the same way that ownership of a corporation can pass among different owners without the public being aware of it. That leaves me to invent a new label based upon the gods' apparent relationship to the human race. For lack of anything better, I will simply, re simply refer to them as the custodial society meaning that specific extraterrestrial society or succession of them, which appears to have had ownership and custody of the Earth since prehistory. For brevity, I will often refer to them simply as custodians. <clears throat> According to the history inscribed on Mesopotamian tablets, there was a time when human beings did not exist at all. Instead, Earth was inhabited by members of the custodial civilization. Custodial life on Earth was not pleasant, however, Custodial efforts to exploit the rich mineral and natural, re and natural resources of Earth proved backbreaking. As one tablet tells us, quote, When the gods like men bore the work and suffered the toil, the toil of the gods was great. The work was heavy and the distress was much, unquote. 
The tablets described lives of endless drudgery as the gods carried out building and excavation and mining operations on the earth. These gods were not at all happy with their lot. They were prone to complaining and backstabbing and rebellion against their leaders. A solution was needed and it was found to create a new creature capable of performing the same labors on earth as the custodians. <clears throat> with this purpose in mind, the custodial gods created homo sapiens or man. Mesopotamian tablets tell a creation story in which a god is put to death by other gods and the body and blood are then mixed into clay. Out of this concoction, a human being is made. The new earth creature is very similar in appearance to its custodial creators. Ancient Mesopotamian tablets credit one god in particular with supervising the genetic manufacturer of Homo sapiens. That god's name is Ea. Ea was reported to be the son of a custodial king who was said to rule another planet with the, within the far-flung custodial empire. Prince Ea was known by the title Enki, which means lord or prince of the earth. Ancient Sumerian texts reveal that Ea's title was not entirely accurate because Ea was said to have lost his dominion over major portions of the earth to his half-brother Enlil during one of the innumerable rivalries and intrigues that seemed to forever preoccupy these custodial rulers. In addition to engineering Homo sapiens, Prince Ea is given credit in Mesopotamian tablets for many other accomplishments. If he was a real person, then Ea could best be described as a scientist and civil engineer of considerable talent. He is said to have drained marshes by the Persian Gulf and to have replaced them with fertile agricultural land. He supervised the construction of dams and dikes. He loved sailing and he built ships in which to navigate the seas. When it came time to create Homo sapiens, Ea demonstrated a good grasp of genetic engineering, but not according to the tablets without trial and error. <clears throat> Most importantly, Ea was described as good-hearted, at least in regard to his creation, Homo sapiens. Mesopotamian texts portray Ea as an advocate who spoke before custodial councils on behalf of the New Earth race. He opposed many of the cruelties that other custodial rulers, including his half-brother Enlil, inflicted upon human beings. It would appear from Sumerian tablets that Ea did not intend Homo sapiens to be harshly treated, but his wishes in that regard were overruled by other custodial leaders. As we have just seen, our ancient and highly civilized ancestors told a very different story of humanity's emergence on Earth than we tell today. The Mesopotamians were clearly not schooled in Darwinian theories of evolution. Nevertheless, there is some surprising anthropological evidence to support this th version of prehistory. According to modern-day analysis of the fossil record, Homo sapiens emerged as a distinct animal species somewhere between 300,000 and 700,000 BC. As time progressed, a number of subspecies of Homo sapiens emerged, including that subspecies to which all human beings to belong today, Homo sapiens sapiens. Homo sapiens sapiens appeared a mere three, uh, 30,000 years ago, and some say only 10 to 20,000 years ago. I think it's up to 40 now. <clears throat> oh, oh, really? I thought I thought it was like 250 years. Uh, the Homo sape sape. Okay. That's, the, that's what that's I thought. When, that's when the artwork starts, I think, is what they're talking about. Okay. Like, so the Chauvet Cave, when they started to paint, that's the kind of viewed as the, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Anatomically but, modern is the Homo sapiens. Homo sape sape is more about mental aspects. And so. Okay. So it's not a physiological difference. Right, no. Yeah. Okay. It's more of a, like they're, they're seeing the advent of abstract thought in the All art right. and the burial practices and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. I'm pretty sure. A so wise, if only wise the watcher thing. here was to check. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this raises an important question. Were the Sumerians referring to Homo sapiens or Homo sapiens sapiens in their creation stories? There seems to be no firm answer. Excellent arguments have been made that they were referring to original Homo sapiens, but I tend to favor the argument that they were probably referring to modern Homo sapiens sapiens for the following reasons. One, the oldest surviving creation stories were written circa 4,000 to 5,000 B.C., it is more likely that a true record of mankind's creation would survive 5,000 to 25,000 years than it would to survive uh, 295,000 years or more. So, okay. Two, if the Sumerians were describing the creation of Homo sapiens sapiens, later events described in Mesota Mesopotamian tablets fall within a more plausible time frame. And three, the Mesopotamians themselves were members of the, hom of the, of the subspecies Homo sapiens sapiens. They were primarily concerned with how they themselves had come into existence. In their various works, ancient Sumerians depicted hairy, animal-like men 
who appear to be a more primitive subspecies of Homo sapiens. The Sumerians clearly viewed those primitive men as an entirely different race of creature. Hmm. I was, I was wondering, too, if he's referring to um, Zachariah Sitchin's in some cases, sort of yeah. translation of the Sumerian tablets. Oh, I don't know. I mean, he does mention Sitchin in here sometimes. I need to go read the... I just need to get the actual... The, the Earth Chronicle series? No, the... What would it be? The um, official, quote-unquote, official version translations of yeah. the of the Enuma Elish and all, all that. Yeah. And see what... Because that direct quote that he gave... Yeah. I'm wondering what source, what, what the source translation is. was that? Uh, it is, uh, it does have a um, citation citation number. So okay. it would be in the bibliography in the back. Okay. I'm going to check it out. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. That's pretty, you know, like they, their work here was really hard. And, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, if the Mesopotamian creation stories are based upon actual events, and if those stories r stories refer to the creation of Homo sapiens sapiens, we would expect Homo sapiens sapiens to appear very, very suddenly in history. And remarkably, this is precisely what happened. The anthropological record reveals that Homo sapiens sapiens appeared on Earth abruptly, not gradually. F. Clark Howell and T.D. White of the University of California at Berkeley have this to say, quote, These people, Homo sapiens sapiens, and their initial material culture appear with seeming suddenness just over 30,000 years ago, probably earlier in Eastern than in Western Europe, unquote. <clears throat> the mystery of this abrupt appearance is deepened by another puzzle. Why did the more primitive Neanderthal man, or Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, suddenly vanish at the same time that modern Homo sapiens sapiens appeared? Evolution is not that fast. Mr. Howell and White ponder this question and conclude, quote, the utter almost abrupt disappearance of Neanderthal people remains one of the enigmas and critical problems in studies of human evolution, unquote. The Encyclopedia Britannica concurs, quote, the factors responsible for the disappearance of the Neanderthal peoples are an important problem to which there is unfortunately still no clear solution, unquote. And <clears throat> it is weird, like Neanderthals are around for hundreds of thousands of years and suddenly when Homo sapiens sap shows up, they vanish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is weird. And also, it's like the somewhat like the Clovis culture. Yeah. Like, I know that's a cultural distinction. Yeah, yeah. But still, it's like they're here for so long and then bam, bam, they gone. vanish. And then suddenly there's like other people within <laughs> yeah. a, like a few hundred years yeah. or something. <clears throat> the Sumerian creation stories do offer a clear solution to this riddle, but it is one that many people would have a difficult time accepting. The sudden appearance of Homo sapiens sapiens accompanied by the abrupt disappearance of Neanderthal man, was caused by intelligent intervention. In chapter 2, we discuss the fact that humans appear to be spiritual beings animating physical bodies. The spirit seems to be the true source of awareness, personality, and intelligence. Without a spiritual entity to animate it, a human body would be little more than a reactive animal or dead. The people of ancient Mesopotamia thoroughly understood this critical fact when they mentioned a spiritual being in connection with the creation of Homo sapiens sapiens. Quote, You have slaughtered a god together with his personality. I have removed your heavy work and I have imposed your toil on man. Unquote. Hmm. Right? And they're talking about that they, they kill a god in order to infuse these new beings with right. this higher... Osiris livers. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Custodial rulers knew that they needed to keep spiritual beings permanently attached to human bodies in order to animate those bodies and make them intelligent enough to perform these labors. So here's more uh, tablet translations. Quote, in the clay, God, a spiritual entity and man. Okay. In the clay, a God and man shall be bound to a unity brought together so that to the end of days, the flesh and the soul, which have in which in a god have ripened, that soul in a bond, blood sh kinship should be bound, right? And the in the god have ripened is referring to the fact that they inseminated, quote unquote, custodial females with the yeah, with the uh, the embryo, yeah, embryo, yeah. The tablets are silent about which personalities were chosen 
to animate the new slave bodies. Based upon how things are done in human society, we might guess that the custodial society used criminals or deviates or prisoners of war, detest detested social and racial groups or nonconformists, and other undesirables to obtain the spiritual beings it needed to animate the new slave race of Earth. Humans were certainly treated like convicts sentenced to hard labor. Quote, With picks and spades, they built the shrines. They built the big canal banks for food of the peoples, for the sustenance of the gods. As beasts of burden, humans were brutally treated by their extraterrestrial masters. The clay tablets tell of vast and catastrophic cruelty per perpetrated by the custodians against their human servants. Cold-blooded population control measures were carried out frequently. And here's a long quote from, uh, quote, 1,200 years had not yet passed when the land extended and the peoples multiplied. The land was bellowing like a bull. The god got disturbed by their uproar. Enlil heard their noise and addressed the great gods. The noise of mankind has become too intense for me. With their uproar, I am deprived of sleep. Cut off supplies for the people. Let there be scarcity of plant life to satisfy their hunger. Uh, Adad should withhold his reign. So I think Adad is a, you know, like a weather god. Yeah. <clears throat> And below the f and the below the flood should not come up from the abyss. Uh, and he's talking about the regular flooding of the rivers that feeds the yeah. So let the wind blow and parch the ground. Let the clouds thicken, but not release a downpour. Let the fields diminish their yields. There must be no rejoicing among them. Unquote. God, what a jerk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In little man. Yeah. An Assyrian tablet adds, quote, command that there be a plague. Let Namtar diminish their, uh, diminish their noise. Let disease, sickness, plague, and pestilence blow upon them like a tornado. They commanded, and there was a plague, and Namtar diminished their noise. Disease, sickness, and plague, and pestilence did blow upon them like a tornado. <laughs> Unquote. These tablets describe ghastly conditions in which food supplies were cut off, in which diseases were laid upon the people that constricted wombs and prevented childbirth and in which, in which starvation became so rampant that human beings were forced to resort to cannibalism. Lesser diseases, such as one resembling influenza, were also visited upon Homo sapiens sapiens, suggesting that custodial gods understood and engaged in biological warfare. When this genocide did not produce a sufficient drop in the human population, the custodians resumed it. Eventually, a decision was made to destroy the human race entirely with a great flood. Many archaeologists today believe that there was a catastrophic flood near the, in the Near East thousands of years ago. One description of this great flood is found in the Babylonian Epic of Gilgamesh, which predates the Bible. According to the Epic, a Babylonian named Utnapishtim was approached by Prince Ea, who opposed the decision to destroy his creation. Ea told Utnapishtim that the other gods planned to cause a deluge to wipe out the human race. Ea, who was described in other writings as a master shipbuilder and sailor, gave Utnapishtim instructions on how to build a boat which could survive the flood. Utnapishtim followed Ea's directions and, with the help of friends, completed the vessel before the flooding began. He then loaded the boat with his gold, his family, and livestock, along with craftsmen and wild animals, and hoisted it off to sea. <clears throat> Babylonian and Assyrian tablets relate that just prior to flooding the land, the custodians scorched it with flame. They then flooded the region by causing a long rainstorm and by breaking the intricate system of dams and dikes that had been built into Mesopotamia to control the erratic flooding of the Tigris and Euphrates. The Gilgamesh epic relates that Utnapishtim and his crew survived the ordeal, and when it was over, they sought out dry land by releasing a series of three birds. If a bird did not return to the boat, Utnapishtim would know that it had found dry land nearby on which to alight. Once back on solid ground, Utnapishtim was joined by several custodians returning from the sky. Instead of destroying these survivors, a degree of leniency prevailed and the custodians transported the surviving humans to another region to live. The tale of Utnapishtim should ring a bell with anyone who is familiar with the biblical story of Noah and the Ark. That is because the tale of Noah, like many other stories from the Old Testament, is taken from older Mesopotamian writings. Biblical authors simply alter names and change the many gods of the original writings into the one god or lord of the Hebrew religion. <clears throat> the, the latter change was an unfortunate one because it, beca it caused a supreme being to be blamed for the brutal acts that earlier writers had attributed to the very ungodlike custodians. Early Mesopotamian writings gave us another famous Old Testament story, the tale of Adam and Eve. The Adam and Eve narrative is also derived 
<clears throat> from earlier Mesopotamian sources, which described life under the custodial gods. The God or Lord God of the Bible's Adam and Eve story can therefore be translated to mean the custodial rulers of earth. The story of Adam and Eve is unique in that it is entirely symbolic, and through its symbols, it provides an intriguing account of early human history. <clears throat> According to the Bible, Adam, who symbolizes first man, was created by God from the dust of the ground. This idea reflects the older Mesopotamian belief that Homo sapiens was created partially from clay. Adam's wife Eve was also created artificially. They both lived in an abundant paradise known as the Garden of Eden. Modern versions of the Bible place the Garden of Eden in the Tigris-Euphrates region of Mesopotamia. The Old Testament tells us that Adam, the first man, was designed to be a servant. His function was to till the soil and to care for the lush gardens and crops owned by his God. As long as Adam and Eve accepted their servant status and obeyed their ever-present masters, all of their physical needs would be met, then they would be permitted to retain or remain in their paradise indefinitely. There was, however, one unpardonable sin that they must never commit. They must never attempt to seep, seek certain types of knowledge. <clears throat> Those forbidden forms of knowledge are symbolized in the story as two trees, the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. The first tree symbolizes an understanding of ethics and justice. The second tree symbolizes the knowledge of how to regain and retain one's spiritual identity and immortality. Adam and Eve obeyed the commandments of their masters and lived in material bliss until another party enters the scene. This intervening party was symbolized in the story as a snake. The serpent convinced Eve to partake of the quote-unquote fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Eve followed the serpent's suggestion, as did Adam, and God became immediately alarmed. Quote, and the Lord God said, Look, the man has become as one of us, knowing good from evil. And now what if he puts forth his hand and takes also of the tree of life and eats and lives forever? Genesis 3.22 The above passage reveals an important truth echoed by, echoed by many religions. A true understanding of ethics, integrity, and justice is a prerequisite to regaining one's spiritual freedom and immortality. Without a foundation in ethics, full spiritual recovery becomes nothing more than a pipe dream. The custodians clearly did not want mankind to begin traveling the road to spiritual recovery. <clears throat> the reason is obvious. The custodial society wanted slaves. It is difficult to make thralls of people who maintain their integrity and sense of ethics. It becomes impossible when those same individuals are uncowed by physical threats due to a reawakened grasp of their spiritual immortality. Most importantly, if spiritual beings could no longer be trapped in human bodies, but could instead use and abandon bodies at will, there would be no spiritual beings available to animate slave bodies. As we recall, Sumerian tablets revealed a custodial intention to permanently attach spiritual beings to human bodies. Early man's attempt to escape this spiritual bondage by eating from the biblical trees, therefore, had to be stopped and fast. Quote, Therefore the Lord God sent him, Adam, forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he had been taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every which way to shield the way and prevent access to the Tree of Life. Genesis 3, 23 through 24. The flaming sword symbolizes the no-nonsense measures that the custodians undertook to ensure that genuine spiritual knowledge would never become available to the human race. To further prevent access to such knowledge, Homo sapiens was condemned to an additional fate. And to Adam, he, God, said, Because you have listed, listened to the urgings of your wife and have eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to, saying, You shall not partake of it, cursed is the ground for you, and toil will you eat its yield for all the days of your life. Thorns, too, and thistles will it bring forth to you as you eat the plants from the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Genesis 3, 17 through 19. This was a highly effective way to deal with Adam and Eve's original sin. The above passage indicates that custodial rulers intended to make human humans live out their entire lives and die without ever rising above the level of arduous material existence. That would leave humans little time to seek out the understanding they needed to become spiritually free. <clears throat> 
As we have seen, early humans were reported to be a constant headache to their custodial masters. <laughs> the slave creatures were not only disobeyed their rulers, they often banded together and rebelled. This made human unity undesirable to Earth's custodial rulers. It was better that humans be disunited. One of the ways in which the problem of human unity was solved is described in the biblical story of the Tower of Babel, a tale which also has its roots in early Mesopotamian writings. According to the Bible, this is what happened after the Great Flood. Quote, And the whole earth spoke one language and used the same words. And it came to pass, as they migrated from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said, Come on, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach the skies, and let us make a name for ourselves, otherwise we will be scattered over the face of the earth. <clears throat> and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which men were building. And the Lord said, Look, the people are united, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will stop them from doing what they take in their minds to do. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language so that they cannot understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there, all over the face of the earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, the name of it is called Babel, because the Lord there did confuse the language of the entire earth, and from there did the Lord scatter them abroad over the face of the earth. Genesis 11, 1 through 9. <clears throat> Ancient stories and legends from other parts of the world indirectly support this Tower of Babel story. The Japanese people, Alaskan Eskimos, South Americans and Egyptians all have traditions stating that their earliest forefathers had been either transported by human-like gods to where the modern descendants live today, or that those gods had been the source of the local languages and writing. Hmm. It may be difficult to accept Mesopotamian and biblical statements that ancient human society had been split apart thousands of years ago in a divide-and-conquer effort by flying extraterrestrials, even though the divide-and-conquer technique is frequently used by military and political leaders on Earth during wartime. Which is true. Yeah. <clears throat> in the story of Adam and Eve, we noted the appearance of a snake. The serpent was said to be God's enemy, Satan, who had literally transformed himself into a reptile. The Bible suggests that snakes are feared and disliked today because of Satan's alleged transformation back in the Garden of Eden. However, it should be remembered that the biblical Adam and Eve story is entire, entirely symbolic, and the snake, too, was a symbol, not an actual reptile. To determine what the biblical snake represented, we must go back once again to older, pre-biblical sources. When we do so, we discover that the snake symbol had two very important meanings in the ancient world. It was associated with the custodial god Ea, reputed creator and benefactor of mankind, and it also represented an influential organization with which Ea was associated. All right, chapter five, the Brotherhood of the Serpent. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Of all the animals revered in ancient human societies, none were as prominent or as important as the snake. The snake was the logo of a group which had become very influential in early human societies of both hemispheres. That group was a disciplined brotherhood dedicated to the dissemination of spiritual knowledge and the attainment of spiritual freedom. This brotherhood of the snake, also known as the brotherhood of the serpent, but which I will often refer to simply as the brotherhood, opposed the enslavement of spiritual beings, and, according to Egyptian writings, it sought to liberate the human race from custodial bondage. The Brotherhood also imparted scientific knowledge and encouraged the high aesthetics that existed in many ancient societies. For these and other reasons, the snake had become a venerated symbol to humans, and, according to Egyptian and biblical text, an object of custodial hatred. When we look to discover who founded the Brotherhood, Mesopotamian texts point right back to that rebellious god, Prince Ea. Ancient Mesopotamian tablets relate that Ea and his father, Anu, possessed profound ethical and spiritual knowledge. This was the same knowledge that was later symbolized as the trees in the biblical Adam and Eve story. In fact, the biblical tree symbol came from a pre-biblical Mesopotamian work, such as the one showing a snake wrapped around the trunk of a tree, identical to later portrayals of the snake in Eden. From the tree in the Mesopotamian depiction hang two pieces of fruit. To the right of the tree is the half-moon symbol of Ea, and to the left is the planet symbol of Anu. The drawing indicates that Ea and Anu were associated with the snake and its teachings, 
And this connection is affirmed by other Mesopotamian texts which describe Anu's palace in the heavens as being guarded by a god of the tree of truth and a god of the tree of life. In one instance, Ea reportedly sent a human to be educated in that very knowledge. Quote, Adapa, thou art going before Anu the king. The road to heaven thou wilt take. When to heaven thou hast ascended and hast approached the gate of Anu, the bearer of life and the grower of truth at the gate of Anu will be standing. And that's Enoch, right? Adapa? Yeah, probably it's Enoch. Yeah, the Cain Enoch. <laughs> Cain, Enoch. There's two Enochs. This always is confusing uh, to me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> the uh, one who made the pillars. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The pillar Enoch. Yeah. Despite all of their reported good intentions, the legendary Ea and the early brotherhood clearly failed to free the human race. Ancient Mesopotamian, Egyptian, and biblical texts relate that the snake was quickly defeated by other custodial factions. The Bible informs us that the serpent in the Garden of Eden was overcome before it was able to complete its mission and give Adam and Eve the fruit from the second tree. Ea, who was symbolized as a snake, was banished to earth and was extensively villainized by his opponents to ensure that he could never again secure a widespread following among human beings. Ea's title was changed from Prince of Earth to Prince of Darkness. And I think that's, uh, that's, the, that's it. Yep. That's a lot uh, to think about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just getting started. <laughs> but that's good. Linky. That's good progress. We made it to, we're in the middle of chapter five. So it's not too bad. Brotherhood of the Serpent. Yep. Now you guys know. <laughs> we're yeah, here to make sure that you're, we're here to make sure that you're always fighting with each other. Yeah. <laughs> What'd you say? Well, no, you're seriously against that. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, we we, yeah. we picked the name kind of based on the idea of the original purpose yeah. of the Brotherhood, as opposed to what Bramley says after it gets corrupted. It's mostly used to foment discord all yeah. across the world and keep everybody fighting each other. Mm. Yeah, and I find that the idea in the Tower of Babel story, just like, I mean, the divide and conquer. Yeah. Idea is it's so clear. It's <laughs> yeah, clear. It's so clear. Yeah. yeah, and here we are. Yep, all <clears throat> speaking different languages, can't understand each other. Yep, and I mean, even um, amongst people who speak the same language and know each other really well, when you have miscommunications, like it causes problems. Yeah. So what better way, you know? Yep. Make sure we don't build any awesome towers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right. it's it's so strange too. They're like, you know, there's these pestilences and plagues and 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 famine and stuff are purposely set on, and then finally, eventually, Enlil is just like, ah, let's kill them all, right? Yeah. And then this flood happens, and they find out that a few people survived, and the rest of the gods are like, you know, f you, Enlil, <laughs> like yeah. they saved a whole bunch of stuff that made the planet beautiful, so they they agree to like kind of not punish the survivors. And then the human race starts to spread out again. And then they go down into Shinar and they're like, let's build a giant tower. And then Enlil's yeah. like, WTF? And he destroys it again. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yep. So, yeah. And you're right. It is a lot to think about. It's when you look at these. I want to come back and hear some more. Yeah. Well, you're welcome on the next episode, too. I, you know, you can come. You can be here for this entire book if you want. But after that. You're out. I'm out. <laughs> I feel like I really want to hear all about this, though. I'll have to arrange some some babysitting, maybe. Yeah, we'll that's see. no problems. We'll the gran see. the grandparents. I, I really like it. I want to hear more. Okay. I love stuff like this. Yeah. I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> and as you go through it, you're just like, God darn it! You get so annoyed because you can see how it's manipulative and just. Yeah. And here we are today, babe. Like you're saying, materialistic, worried about all this stuff. Yep. We have all and this constantly stuff. at each other's throats. Yeah. You know? Just about the stuff. Yeah. Where's the stuff? Yeah. One of our one of our fights, just so everybody can know out there. <laughs> She's pointing at Kyle. Yeah. Not me. Is where is that thing? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh hey, that's babe, a, where's my wow? That's a, <laughs> that's a real, real sticky one to I ask. I think it's quite logical. <laughs> you ask the person that moves stuff all the time <laughs> where things are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but 
often I go and find it and I'm like, just yeah. open your eyes, babe. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm really bad at looking for things. Yeah. But everybody's seen the Unless meme. Unless it's arrowheads. I'm sure everybody's seen the meme with the, the Look. about the male gender. Just it has problems finding things. That's all. Well, well, it's just what you know, because the the meme with the ketchup in the door and yeah, the door. yeah. Well, it's, it's funny now because I'm thinking, I'm you know, and I'm like, you know, these are like the you know, who are we? What am I? What am I doing here? What is all that stuff out in the universe? Are some of the first questions ever asked? And Kyle's like, no, no, no. The first question was, where is my rock? <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> the next time I lose something and I ask you where it is, just be like, just wait ten thousand years, and you'll probably find it, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I, to I walk guess, around in the middle of the woods and find a tool that someone left there. Right, but you can't but find can't, that thing you had I yesterday. I can't find my screwdriver <laughs> from yesterday. <laughs> I'm going to work on giving you grace all the time, but but mostly what happens is I have already seen in my peripheral you come in from the place where it is. And yeah. I know you didn't really look that well. <laughs> That's probably true. Because <laughs> oh, I'm assuming you moved it. Oh, that's classic. <laughs> no, because you're just thinking about other things yeah. in your It's okay. We all are. That's one great thing about living completely alone is like if I lose something, I have no one to blame oh, myself. Oh, yes. That's, that's <laughs> nice. You know, and I'm just like. You I, can't sow discord amongst right, yourself. Right. I'm not like, God damn it. Where did she put this thing? I know <laughs> that I'm the one who lost it. And so there's just, I'm just like, well, I'll find it eventually. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I really, I really appreciate you sitting in, I, you know, and you can speak up more. So I, I well, kept seeing you come forward to say something, and then you wouldn't do it. So you can totally. Well, like I was telling you on one of the breaks, you know, I do kind of get lost in the fact that oh, I am sitting here. You <laughs> yeah. Know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get. I'll get into what you're saying. Yeah. She's so used to listening doodling. to the podcast that she's just hearing it in the headphones, and yeah. it's like, no, this is a no, no, no. You're actually in here. Yeah. I have a little doodle thing I'm doing over here. I'm trying to listen, and then you know, checking yeah. out, checking out my bibs, <laughs> checking out bibs, other dude, brother. <laughs> you know, seeing how it's going in yeah. here. You know, because I live here. So I'm in there with the kid. Kyle comes out. Love you. Bye. See you on the other side. Yeah. You know, now, tonight, here I am. Yeah. In the midst of it. In it. <laughs> so I think I might want to come back. I won't. I won't come back too much. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, it's fine. Whenever I'll you want to. A few to. times. Yeah. Whenever you want to. We'll make it stick. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, a, th a third perspective is great. Yeah. I don't have any problem with it. Yeah. yeah. So whenever you want to, it's not a problem. All right. But we might have to change it to like brothers and sisters of the serpent. No, <laughs> we're not changing shit. Just let me yeah. hang okay. here for a minute All right. and I'll yeah, say yeah. a couple things. All right. You guys <laughs> can get a hold of us, brothers of the serpent at gmail.com. Go to the website, brothers of the serpent.com. Check out the Instinctopedia and the glossary and the snake skins. Uh, also, uh, join the Pyramid Scheme uh, with Patreon or PayPal. We really thank all of you who have done that. Have you been looking at the donations? Uh, have, uh, <laughs> That's all right. Well, not, not in the past well, few days, okay, but we'll yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right, yeah. We really appreciate everybody who's done it. Um, really helps the show and helps us, you know, build up the Pyramid Scheme, which will eventually one day get us straight to pyramids. And our, uh, our what are we calling it? Uh, expedition uh, got delayed, obviously. So, oh, yes. Uh, That's right. Very it's, sad. I got the notification on my calendar today. Oh, expedition. yeah. Expedition. Well, we would be like, going oh. right now. Damn it. Yeah. But hopefully everybody's doing good out there. Stay safe. Yep. And uh, we'll go on our expedition when things go back to normal. That's right. We're still going. We just have to postpone it just like everything else. Also, give us reviews. Uh, iTunes reviews really help sp uh, spread the show around. So, And thank you to all of you who have done that. We're almost, we almost have 200 reviews now, so that's awesome. Wow. Um, uh, share the shows any way you can. Follow us on Twitter at Snake Bros and No Vowels, S-N-K-B-R-S. Join the Facebook group run by Jordan. Join the Discord chat, which is the Snake Pit and Troll Room. And so sometimes we, you know, we broadcast live to the Snake Pit over the Discord chat. So if you want to join in on that. Uh, those are fun. Yeah, those are fun. Uh, also, the Library of the Serpent, which is run by Jeff. Uh, it has tons and tons of, uh, you know, of, of publicly available texts, papers, and tomes and other books that we've talked about on the, that are that are basically things that are referenced on this podcast. He's gone through and made this enormous collection. Um, and then there are also links to purchase books that are not in the public domain. 
Uh, so that's run by Jeff and maintained by Jeff, who also runs the Discord chat. So thanks to him very much. Part of the value yeah, for value buddy. system. He's awesome. Uh, another value for value guy is History Shift, of course, who makes all of our YouTube videos. So if you are listening to this on YouTube, this is his work. So follow him on YouTube and on Twitter <clears throat> at History Shift. And Pod Doodles takes our podcasts and turns them into doodles, and you can watch him draw while you listen to the podcast. It's really cool. So follow him on Twitter and on YouTube. Pod Doodles. Uh, Cosmographia, the podcast we do with Randall Carlson. Check that out. We also have a subreddit, r forward slash Brothers of the Servant. Go there and give us uh, upvotes or updutes. I think they call them on there. <laughs> it's really, it's like, the, it's a little up arrow, but people like have an updute. <laughs> I don't know why they call it updute, but that's what they say. <laughs> also, thanks to Where Did the Road Go, Uncharted X, Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape, The C Word Podcast, Drive America, Conspiracy Normal, and The Cosmic Tusk. Thank you guys very much. Yes. Can I say something? Can yeah. I say thank you? And I want to say thank you to everyone. I live with these guys, and they really do love what they do. So thank you for following. Thank you for listening. No, oh, yeah. I appreciate it, too. Yeah, and yeah. a lot of people have said thank you to you for your awesome intros. Oh, yeah. You know, who was, I love who was that? Who was it. that girl with that beautiful voice? I'm like, yeah, well, now she's been in here the whole show. Yeah. Here I am. <laughs> thank you. I love doing it. And we didn't have to fight over that that intro. It was like, you know, it was first, perfect. Yeah. yeah, first time. We just hit recording. Zero fight. Well, yeah. because I was staying in. <laughs> See, normally we argue, then I leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe next time we'll have a we'll have a, a live but not live argument. Okay. There we go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll be, we'll make you do it multiple times while the music's still playing. No, 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 no. no. Yeah. Try it one more time. All right, all right, there we go. It just all right, breaks guys. those nerves off. Yeah. It's good, it's good. Yeah, all right, guys. Thank you very much. We love you. Good night, Adamu. Yep, get back to work. Yeah, get back to work. <laughs> That's right. Jeez. We got to get back to work. That's right.